Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Miguel Iterati is here for the Lights Out podcast. Chris Lytle is on the way back from London. He was at the bare knuckle fighting, but he's got us on assignment and we've got a heavy assignment. This is one of those assignments that, you know, you got to put, you got to put your work into. We've got another all-time great in the sport of MMA joining us for a deep dive. And that is the great Frank Shamrock. Frank, how are you? I'm fantastic, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Mike? All right, so Frank, your life, you know, as we said pr previous to the interview starting, it's the exact makeup of a movie, but it's one of those things where you say, come on, it's too far-fetched, it's too far-fetched. But, you know, the reality is, is um, it's hard to wrap your head around. Like, your normal growing up was much different than everybody else's. So at the age of 11, you got placed in a juvenile uh, detention facility. At 13, you get out and you first meet Bob Shamrock. Would you mind describing that for our audience? For sure, yeah. Well, um, you know, I left home with a, a really bad home. And then, um, you know, I, I didn't, I moved from group home to group home and foster home to foster home. Um, and I found this what I thought was an ingenious tool for touring the state of California, which was committing crimes. Cause every time I did, they would move me to a new home. And um, I didn't realize I was increasing my security and getting into more and more trouble. Cause I'd never really gotten trouble or it felt like it. Um, and that's when I met Bob Shamrock. I was almost 13 years old. I was in the um, Shasta County juvenile hall and uh, he came in to interview me like he does for, or did for all the boys. Um, and yeah, I was just struck. He was, you know, had tons of gold and was all flashy and, uh, really, you know, yeah, yeah. He looked really different than every other guy who came through that door. Um, you know, they were all serious and, and suited up and, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, I don't want to say, uh, strict, but they were you know, overbearing. And so, uh, uh, when Bob came in, you know, I, I was intrigued by him because he looked so different. And then, uh, you know, he asked me about myself and I went to tell him my kind of sob story, you know, how bad things were and all that. Um, and he just cut me off. He's like, yeah, uh, you know, don't really care about that. You know, we, we build men, we build boys and, uh, you know, I do it at my boys ranch. And then he gave me his pitch and it was just fantastic. It, it was, you know, you'll have 20 brothers and you'll play sports and we'll turn you into men. And that's what I'd always looked for. Um, and so when he left, like I thought, I, I didn't think he would take me because I had, I'd been in so much trouble by then. Um, but then, yeah, a couple months later, I was on my way to his group home, riding right next to him in his, um, you know, 56 Cadillac. Now, Fr Frank, I, I, I don't want to jump too early in the interview into stuff, but Bob and your relationship, you know, on the surface, it was always very special because obviously, you know, Bob took care of you and you became, you know, what you did that way. But there are ugly people in the business and people like that, that, that give it an ugly innuendo. Do you want to address that? Like, I mean, was, was, was it something uncomfortable or was Bob really on the up and up with you? You know, that's, I think that's important for you to answer because there's so much talk about, you know, uncomfortable things that, and that don't, have any proof really so i'd like to hear from your your mouth was was bob a person that abused some or was he really a a, a genuinely 100 percent good person no he didn't he never abused anybody he was a good uh catholic man and you know all the principles i follow today were from bob shamrock he would he would never you know do anything outside of god's choice for for us and he would never harm a child. So all those people are idiots. And by the way, I was molested many times in group homes, foster homes, and et cetera. I was never bothered at the Shamrock Boys Ranch. I think you. that's you. where therein lies the confusion. Because when you go from group home to group home, there's a lot of people that don't have the best interests of the people coming into their homes. And I believe you documented that in your book, 
which is something that is almost impossible to get over later on in life. And I think therein lies the confusion where people will, will say, well, it had to been Bob. It had to been Bob. But the reality of the situation is when you look at a guy like Bob Shamrock, you compare him. There's only one other comparable person that I can place him with. And, and that's uh, Carlson, Carlson Gracie Sr. Oh, yeah. Sure. You've got two people that had no intention of ever writing any coattails, thinking that they're going to make any type of money off something that really no money existed in. And they took people and they developed them into like adults. It's like that's, that's the definition of a hero. It's selfless. Yeah, he was a good man. And, and that's why, you know, I do the stuff that I do today. You know, he taught me how to be a man. And that's what every young man is looking for, especially troubled young men like me who grew up without fathers. And, you know, some some parents are good. Some parents are bad. Some parents are just fine. Um, you know, I had crappy parents and I had a crappy start. But when I met Bob, you know, I still got in trouble, you know, went to prison. I, you know, didn't listen to him but um you know when i was sitting there alone in prison all i could hear was his advice his words and then you know he continued to support me and that's what dads do you know they just they give you advice <laughs> when they need to they kick your ass and then they stand by you and that's you know that's what he did for me how many people do you think he touched oh man i mean he had two thousand kids so you know he's got a and then you know it's not just helping kids when you help a kid you you know you heal part of a family you you bring the family together you know you i mean you know ken and i were champions but there's many other young men who just became good men started their own families and are teaching that shamrock way the way you know the way bob taught us and that's 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 the biggest value that i got besides him giving me my name was wow. you know teaching me how to be a man and then why it's so important that men share that, give that away and, you know, be fathers to other men and, and kids. Like it's, you know, when you don't have an example, what do you do? Uh, I followed the street thugs because they were the ones who wanted to pay attention to me, but you know, that ended me up in prison. A guy like Bob Shamrock deserves a statue of he does. himself somewhere. Yeah, he does. <laughs> all, all that he Frank, back. Frank, were you, were you and Ken the only guys that kind of got the, the Shamrock name, or were there a couple others maybe that weren't fighters or every? Was that something extra special for you, or or was it oh, something yeah. that got? No, it was only two of us, and okay, cool. I, I, uh, you know, Bob was real. He was a real loving man, and you know, when him and his wife, you know, separated, um, you know, he he lost his sort of you know family. He lost his wife. He lost his partner, and the boys you know, they were his boys and they were temporary boys and they were always supposed to be temporary. You know, him and his wife agreed on that. You know, we're going to do this, but you know, we're not going to keep them. We're just going to help them. And, you know, after she left, it was really hard on him. And, and then Ken came along and he, and he fell in love with Ken, you know, Ken was a, you know, the, the, had the bill he always wanted and was a tough kid. And, and then, you know, and needed a ton of help. You know, he needed so much help. He was, you know, way angrier than I was. And so I think Bob put, you know, took some of that broken heartedness and put it into Ken. And then, you know, nine years later, I come along and, you know, he did the same for me. And I think it's because he was lonely. He wanted to have his own family and he wasn't able to. So this is how he, this is how he had his family. And he ended up you know, with tons of grandkids and, you know, family. Wow. Wow. Yeah, not, not a negative, so, not a real negative ag uh, about it. So very, very yeah, much. So, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. so, you mentioned that you had a lot of anger. Obviously, you addressed where it came from, probably a lot of it where it came from. In order to get sober, you have to deal with that. And it's one of the hardest rocks that you can either climb or take off of your back. What was the process that you took in order to kind of get that weight off of you? Well, first I started talking about it because it was something I never talked about for years and years. <laughs> really never told anybody, you know, that I'd been locked in closets and I had all this stuff going on. You know, I had a, a sport to build and a brand to uphold. Um, 
And so it just never, you know, it never came out until I became really successful. And then I realized, you know, I was unhappy and I was still angry and I was still mad and I still had these feelings inside. Um, and my therapy started in sharing and I started sharing in juvenile halls and I started sharing with my people, incarcerated youth who I knew were going through the same things that I was going through. And, you know, the process of talking to them and sharing it and, and, you know, hearing back what was happening to them was, was really healing because then I didn't feel alone with it. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've forgiven my mom and, and I've asked for forgiveness for my anger because, you know, I, I think she was just doing it to survive and that's how she was taught. But, you know, I was mad about it for 30 years and then, you know, I finally decided to forgive her. And in the process, I had to forgive myself for being angry for 30 years. That's not an easy process. <laughs> it's not it's really easy. Not. <laughs> It's tough. And we all have those things in our past. And we all have those, you know, parts of ourselves that we, I call it the secret life. You know, the, the part of you that you never tell anybody and it just rolls around in your head. And if you can get it out, if you can, you know, forgive yourself, forgive others and, you know, move on. I mean, now it's like it didn't happen. Now, when I say it, it's much like fighting. Like I have to think about it and I have to think about the feelings associated with it because I don't, it's not a part of my life anymore. I, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but while you're forgiving people and you're talking about that, and obviously, you know, my, myself, I've been through my own similar reconciliation. So I, I, I'm drinking up everything you say, but how's your relationship with Ken now? Like, is that something you want? You can talk about you friends with Ken still or? Yeah. Yeah. We're friends uh, and our relationship remains the same as when it started. I don't know a lot about the whole guy. I don't know what he does in his daily life. And we're not like, you know, hanging out brothers. Um, and so, you know, we're friendly, you know, we communicate on holidays, but, but that's about it. I never got to know him, you know, past the fighting and that image. And, you know, uh, my love for him has matured because I see him as a grandfather now. And I just became a grandfather. So, you know, we have that in common. Um, but, you know, like I wouldn't pick up the phone and call him unless it was business because I just wouldn't know what to say. Right. Well, you guys went to war with each other. You got back. <laughs> There's mutual respect, you know, I mean, it's just live and let live. I mean, you guys have each other's lives. So let's talk about the first time you guys met, at least in the gym setting, April 5th, 1994. That is your first day of training. Yeah. Yeah. Very first day of martial arts training. And, uh, you know, when I was in prison, my uh, Bob had sat me down and gave me the final dad talk. I was just about to get out of Folsom prison and, um, in 94 early 94. And he sat me down. And he's like, all right, you know, here's your opportunity. You know, you've done the work because I, you know, I put on 25 pounds of muscle when I was in prison. And he's like, there's this brand new sport coming out. Uh, it's just like wrestling. And I think you'd be great at it. And that's how he sold me on it. Uh, the other option was to be a stripper because Ken had been a stripper. And well, so he's like, you'd be a great fighter or a great stripper. And <laughs> I was like, well, I'll probably just do the fighting thing. But he literally sold it as as it's like professional wrestling, only, you know, tougher. And I loved professional wrestling as a kid. So I I, I went all in. Um, I didn't even know you could tap during the tryout. <laughs> I don't know if Jason uh, said that, but I think he was the one who was uh, yelling, you know, does he know how to tap or does he know about tapping? Um, because no one had told me I, I, I didn't see it on TV. I had no idea what was going on. And the tryouts back then were basically you know, work you to death and then beat you to death. And if you don't quit, you know, you're on the team. And Ken did that, you know, personally for me and gave me quite the introduction. So, but, well, but hold on, we go. Uh, Scott Bissack, we had him on. Yeah. He actually said that, and Jason, both of them have said, what you went through was actually worse than <laughs> everybody else. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Yeah, Ken didn't really want me there. You know, I was a, uh, I was a thug. I'd been in prison. I had crazy long hair, and you know, I had a prison strut. And I think it was an front to you know everything he was 
you know, standing for at that time. And so, yeah, he, he gave me a serious beating. It took me a good two weeks to recover. And I mean, I couldn't walk for a week. I had to, you know, I, I was living on the second story of his house, which is so weird. And I'd have to scoot down the stairs because he got me in a heel hook or something and just tore my knees out and I, I couldn't walk. Uh, but, you know, I healed up and I went back. Wow. Wow. So those jump-ins is what you guys refer to them as. Did you have to, did you have the opportunity to jump any members in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, you know, it was the conditioning-based tryout with a, you know, mock fight afterwards. And literally, it, we would just exhaust people with 500 squats, sit-ups, push-ups, and leg lifts. And you'd be physically, you know, that takes an hour and 20 minutes. So for an hour and 20 minutes, you're just doing constant, you know, muscular exertion. and You have no energy. And then you fight somebody for 20 minutes. And I did it to tons of people. Um and I saw the toughest men in the world, you know, break and grab their bags and run out crying. And, you know, it was a really weird um, time period. But at that time, the only prerequisite for being a fighter was that you could take an ass open and not quit. That was it. It'd be a good nail. Yeah, it'd be a good nail. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. The thing now, is. At what, point, at what point in that do they say, all right, you know. This is a heel hook, <laughs> you know, I mean, start teaching you. Yeah, that came after the tryout. Yeah, I didn't know any of the stuff. I didn't even know you could tap. And so, yeah, when he when Ken was tearing my knee out, I was just screaming. And then somebody said, I thought it was Jim. Uh, somebody said, hey, does he know about tapping? And I just started screaming tap because I didn't even know what the tap was. But I sensed it might be, you know, stopping the pain. Um and I have to assume everyone thought, you know, I knew what was going on, but I literally, you know, I'd never seen the sport. I had no idea what, I didn't know what a submission was. I didn't know anything. Uh, but, you know, in prison, I, you know, I held my own. I've been in some fights and, you know, I was considered a tough guy, you know, walking around in prison. Okay. So you, you say that, but, you know, there, there's tough guys, but then there's well-rounded wrestler types that just have a plan. And that they're tough rather than just being tough. Yeah. From 16 to 21, you were in prison. Where does your wrestling come from? Uh, I'm, I just study. I'm a nerd. I'm actually not a good wrestler. And a good high school wrestler will beat me at, at straight wrestling. But I, I understand all the fundamentals of it. And I study the biomechanics. I study human structure. So I know where my strengths are in the mechanics of wrestling and that's it and that, that's how i was so successful guys is i i was a nerd and everyone else was a, a meathead and i was studying biomechanics and you know natural movements and how animals fight like i was studying all these weird ideas because i could tell just by talking to people and asking questions and watching what was going on that nobody really knew what was going on Nobody knew how to fight. Nobody knew what we were doing. You know, Ken had a system from Japan. Ken had a base of wrestling and Ken was a street fighter. So he knew how to kick ass. But, you know, that that doesn't translate for every human being. And so because my body was at risk and my life was at risk, I just took it very, very seriously. And I studied everything I could and every beating I took, you know, I took it, but I was learning and I was understanding. And then, then I'd ask questions, you know, like, hey, what about this? And what about that? And sometimes the questions would el uh, elicit more beatings because in that, <laughs> supposed to ask questions. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think uh, we, we, we interviewed Mark Schultz, you know, the former wrestler, fought a yep. couple times. And he started wrestling as a junior in high school, became a national champion and gold medalist. Like that's something that's very difficult to wrap your head around. Yeah. Like that, that type of, of movement. But when we look at yours, it's actually, it's, it, it screams that it's not true because it's impossible <laughs> to, it, it's impossible to, to wrap your head around it. So April 5th, 1994, probably needed a month or two to heal up from your injuries. Yeah. So you got about six months of training. And then on December 16th, 1994, you fight in a four-man tournament where six and two Boss Rutan is your first opponent. 
Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. In hindsight, it's completely insane. And um, yeah, but that's, uh, you know, I I have 23 felony convictions. I've never had a job in my life. I knew when I was sitting in prison what the rest of my life looked like because all the people that I was running around on the streets with were in prison. And I was those are my friends. Those are my community. Those are my mentors. And it just dawned on me that I, I, I have to do everything to get out of here. You know, I also had a young son and for the first time I wanted, you know, I, I was a father and I had no skills, no resources, no money. I couldn't even get to a prison close to my son. So my goal was to do anything I needed to do to provide for my family. You know, one of the things that I, don't sell yourself short, too, because from the very, 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 very beginning, you were an elite athlete. I mean, yeah, maybe untrained. But you had that. Yeah. So maybe the six months of training, you know, that <laughs> it, it, it was enough to survive boss because that's how does how does the boss match come along? Was it Bob who offered it to you? Was it Ken who offered it to yeah. you? Yeah, I think it came down the line through Ken. He was the, you know, manager, trainer, mentor. Um, and he just told me one day, hey, you got this opportunity to go to Japan. I actually went to Japan two months early to finish my training. And I lived in um, Shin Yokohama. Uh, I'm sorry. I lived in uh, Kanagawa Ku, uh, just outside of Shin Yokohama. And um, who's Jim? Uh, Pancras. Yeah. The Pancras. The Pancras is okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was it was um, you know it was really weird because I I did all the time in prison and then all of a sudden I'm being you know shipped off to Japan. No one told me who I was fighting. They just told me I was going to finish my training in Japan. And that was fascinating because I didn't speak Japanese and nobody spoke English. And uh, it was really hard to just figure out what was going on. So I just followed suit. I did what everyone else did. Uh, but I got some great lessons from, from my teachers there, which was Minoru Suzuki and uh, Masafunaki. And, you know, they both took time to show me stuff. Like I wasn't good at takedowns. Like I didn't get it. I didn't understand. And I didn't know how to use my body weight. I was 190, you know, two or three pounds. And I didn't know what to do with it because no one had ever really told me. And, you know, both of those guys through very simple, because they spoke, you know, very little English, through very simple mechanical um, examples, you know, a ball and a stick, <laughs> you know, like just the simplest things. They showed this to me and I went, wow, okay, that makes like so much sense at, at so many levels. Um, and what it did for my brain was open up my ability to think mechanically, you know, to look at everything as a mechanical process, you know, to look at everything as a, you know, a series of steps, you know, inside of your biomechanics, you know, and, and just, it was so profound and I'm sure they just took, you know, it was like two minutes, they <laughs> took a ball and it showed it to me, but it changed how I thought. It eliminated the distractions as well. Yeah. yeah. Like you had no choice. You had to be, you had to be there. You had to be a 24 seven. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the good things about being in prison is you get to spend a lot of time with yourself. So you either sit there and get angrier and build your community or you, you do stuff. And, you know, I was very interested in bodybuilding. Thanks to Bob. You know, he sent me all kinds of books and stuff to learn. And, you know, within months of getting in prison, I was teaching people how to lift weights. You know, I ran a weightlifting crew <laughs> and that evolved into, you know, by the end, I was running uh, PT training for 400 convicts that were going to fight fires. And it was just because I was interested in it. You know, I was articulate. I was, you know, I wanted to learn about it. And when you want to learn about something, you're, you're unstoppable. You know, if you don't want to learn something, then you're just a dead piece of wood. But as long as you're willing to learn, you know, people people are interested in it and people want to help you and people want to be a part of that. So that was huge for me. You know, just having Bob there, you know, he always taught me to be an athlete, to be strong, to build your body, build your body, build your mind, build your spirit. And that, you know, was the basis of my martial arts, you know, and still is to this day. That's excellent. So, Bas Rutten, it's your first fight, Pancrase 13th, December 16th, 1994. He's 6-2. and two. 
and it's your debut. Did you have any concerns going into this fight? Yeah, well, I no. I mean, I was scared to death because I'd never done this, you know, I never fought in, in a ring. And I wasn't really a street fighter. I mean, I did what I had to do to survive. But I wasn't like a tough guy. Never wanted to get into a physical altercation. When you come from a home of abuse or when you've been abused, the last thing you want is to be involved in more abuse. So it was really terrifying. Um, but that's where I learned to meditate. <laughs> that's where I learned to calm my mind, right? I'm sitting in a, in a, a steel building in Japan in freezing cold, just going, oh, yeah, it's coming up in now 10 days and nine days. And, and so it took, you know, it just took all my energy from me to think about this and worry about it. And so I learned to breathe and meditate really at that time. Um, and then I still didn't know who Boss Rutten was. Uh, like I guess still, uh, I only knew when people would say, you know, who are you fighting ne next? I would say, oh, Boss Rutten. And they would, the Japanese people, because they can't tell a lie, they oh. would look at, they would go like, oh, and they're like, <laughs> like, oh, goodbye. Oh, I'm sorry. And it was, I was like, well, this doesn't look good. I, I know how to read people. This does not look good uh, at all. And so that terrified me. And then when I got to the arena, I could literally, he was in the dressing room next to me, which was a very, you know, I think it was separated by cloth. And I could hear him kicking the tie pads. And I'd never heard anything so loud and powerful. He was going, ah, and it was, I was like, oh my God. Like I, I was not able to generate that type of power and energy. And, and so that terrified me. So walking in, I was pretty terrified. Yeah. Wow. So you win, you beat Bass by decision, but normally it's your first fight, huge fight, definitely an underdog. Get your hand raised, you go out, hang out, but you've got another fight in about 20 minutes. Adrenaline dumps, concerns, did you want to pull out? Yeah, I, I was just remained scared to death, uh, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I won, because I didn't really know i'd won or even thought i'd won because the the very first kick he threw he broke my nose i mean he's like kicked me right in the face and broke my nose and i was like oh oh i guess i guess i do have to keep my hands up like it was just such a a a, a wake-up call you know doing it in front of all those people in front of the hot lights with somebody who's not your friend or teammate and yeah huge it was huge you know i was done after the first fight and then when they told me I was fighting uh, Yamada next, I was like, oh man, because I trained in a gym with him and he just destroyed me. Like he would just, he got me in every hole and I never even got close to him. And so I was like, oh man. But, you know, the, the other fear was, you know, if you didn't fight your heart out, Ken would kick your ass. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you know, Bob would be bad. Yeah, well, yeah, but, well, you know, that's that's how things were done in that day. If you didn't perform, you know, at your best, you know, Ken would would take you for a run because that's how you taught lessons back then. And so, so, I was so you had Ken beating me up. Well. Like, you'll have to excuse me if, if my memory is kind of like, I know you fought boss a couple of times, but was that first fight the one where you guys were like in a heel hook exchange? And he's he's hitting you in the face, and you're like smiling at him. It's nah, not Mike. It's second or third. Okay, I think all right. We'll, we'll wait. We'll, Michael, take us there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so Manabu, he's uh, twelve five and two, but that's a Japan twelve five and two, which means he's an American murderer. Like that record <laughs> here is insane um, in terms of like quality of of opponent. He's kind of one of their golden boys as well. Yeah, he was definitely highly regarded. You know, uh, I was a young boy, basically. So what young boys do is you you do all your exercises, you get all the food ready, you get everything clean, and you wait for the fighters to come in. And then, you know, they come in in order of, you know, status, and they basically do whatever they want. But I could tell the deference paid to him, you know, when by the other young boys as to what his skill set was. And then when he wanted to wrestle with me, I was like, yeah, of course. And he just beat my ass and he was so stumpy like he couldn't hook him like his arms were short his legs were short and muscular so he was just really hard to to do anything to both in training and then in, in the fight as well but but Frank, wow. you, you actually went to japan as a young boy yeah yeah i was a young boy when i went to japan 
Um, and I had a higher status than the other young boys because I had a fight planned. And okay. when you're a young boy, you just serve until someday master turns to you and says, hey, you're fighting on this date. And then the minute you fight, you become a fighter and your status changes. But I came in as, you know, Ken's little brother with a fight already planned. So I was the highest of the young boys. Um, but I still did young boy duties. You know, I, you, you, I, you, you had to cook Ken's meals. <laughs> yeah, I, I took care of things. Yeah, that's what that's what you do. You wipe, you know, you warm everybody up, you clean the mats, you wipe down the gear, you know, you're a punching bag when needed. And then you, you know, massage people, stretch people, you do whatever is asked. And then, you know, when they're gone, you clean everything up again and wow. you rest. Yeah, that's where I started. Archie Moore, the famous yeah. boxer. <laughs> and Muhammad Ali cleaning toilets. It's that same process. Yeah. Wow. So you go one and one in your first tournament. When you leave there, did you understand that your entire life was about to be just consumed with this sport at that point? Well, yeah, because it already had. You know, I'd already made a full commitment. You know, what? Uh, besides the, the weightlifting and you know, the focus of that in prison, I, I went to school, I went to college and I, you know, I got educated, I read a lot and I developed a really strong discipline for learning and documenting it. And so, you know, I wrote all that, all my workouts down, all my, you know, theories, ideas, I would, I was outpouring this information and then collecting data. And when, um, you know, when I became a fighter, I did the exact same thing. And I just noticed no one else was doing it. You know, at first they were Snickers. People laughed at me and, you know, I was kind of a nerd. But, um, you know, I think after like six or seven months, I was choking people and, you know, I was doing really well in the gym. And so, you know, that mindset and that discipline of learning and documenting and I would draw diagrams and, you know, skeletal figures and all kinds of crazy stuff. Wow. So you can do a quick turnaround. You fight uh, Katsumi in Inagaki in January, but then in March, Masakatsu Funaki is your opponent. 14 and three, legend of the sport. Why were they throwing you in the deep end so early? I have no idea. I think, you know, they, they liked beating on me. I mean, I was super strong and I never quit. And then, you know, I was really respectful about it all because I generally truly wanted to learn and I was terrified. I was literally terrified every day. So it, it, you know, I don't know. I think they thought I was, you know, beat honorable. But, but let me ask you a question though. You're Ken's brother. <laughs> Did you feel that pressure? Did you feel like it was like, if they beat you, they might get Ken. Was there that type of uh, promotion behind it? Was it something that you felt some pressure that way? Um, I mean, I, I, I just felt the pressure that I needed to win. Like, that was my thing. And then, you know, and then my thing with Ken was I, I was afraid I'd disappoint him, not perform well and get my ass kicked. So that was the other thing. So those two yeah. things were enough to drive me, you know, to train all the time, focus all the time. You know, I don't, I don't watch sports. I still don't watch sports. You know, I train, I listen, I learn. And I do that with business. I go with everything. At that time, I only did it with fighting and nothing else. I didn't have another life. I didn't have relationships. I didn't date. I didn't do anything. You know, I went to the gym and I trained every day and I learned because that, because my life, I felt like my life was on the line. So you, Ken and Jason DeLucia all lived together for a while. Yeah. Man, that's a rough house. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, why don't yeah. you talk about Jason for a little bit? We just interviewed yeah. him and he had nice things to say about you. Why don't you give us your from the heart about Jason? Yeah, just you know what? He is a wonderful man and a great martial artist. And you know, when I came into this sport, I didn't know about martial arts. I didn't I mean, I saw it on TV and I took karate at the Y when I was like you know, eight or something, but I never got involved in the martial arts community and the culture of it. And so I never understood the reason why this culture existed because in the fighting culture, you, you just beat people up and then you move on to the next thing. 
Um, and so Jason was the first guy to really open my eyes, you know, to what martial arts culture is. And he was, you know, I think he was a wushu guy and, you know, he really was, you know, he really believed and he really supported and was, you know, a proud member of that community. Like that was his thing. And to me at the time, I was like, I, does it work? Like what, <laughs> I just need the data, but the data coming back was, this is a valuable thing. You know, there's com strong community here. Um, there's support, there's, you know, the things that I was missing in life. And so, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever told Jason this, but a lot of my martial arts, you know, um, questions and pursuit came from watching him and going, you know, what is he doing and why is he doing this? And why is he so committed? Um, you know, because technically there's no proof that that stuff works in this, in this combat arena. <laughs> like there's no data. Um, but he, he believed and there was a huge value in that. And so, you know, I, I went in search of that value in all communities that were martial arts based. And, you know, to this day, those, th that community supports me. You know, I have students that are 70 years old. I have, you know, students that are seven years old. I have people, you know, it's a community that will always, because they're on the right mission of personal development and, and learning this thing, you know, they'll always support you if you're on the same mission. So they were throwing you to the wolves. Obviously, Funaki's from All, All Japan Pro Wrestling, another legend uh, from Japan. Went on to fight Minoru, Hicks and Gracie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Minoru, Minoru Suzuki is right after that. He's 13 and three, one of the founding fathers of the sport of mixed, of mixed martial arts in Japan in general. Like they're throwing you just <laughs> wolf after wolf after wolf. Yeah. Yeah. They seem to like me. I think, uh, you know, my first nickname was um, the squirrel. They called me the squirrel in Japanese because I, I would get caught in moves that seemed like they were finishing those, but I would just kind of wiggle out and, you know, use my body strength and my mobility and, you know, my flexibility. And I would just, you know, kind of defy the mechanics of it. And, and they thought that was fascinating, um, you know, and then I also kind of looked Japanesey, like when my hair grew out, I kind of looked like, uh, I don't know if you guys know who uh, Tamura is, mm -hmm. uh, the ring. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, I was like the Japanese Tamura, you know, so I just, they seemed to, you know, just love me. Um, I don't know if they were loving me by giving me these fights, but you know, they, they certainly loved my character and what I did and how I performed. Frank, I'm one of those that remembers they wanted to do you and Tamura for a long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We finally, did you see the rings match we did? Yes, I did see it, oh. but it was a few years be beyond, but yes. Yeah. yeah, we were old by then, but I, I uh, it was, you know, all these, you know, world records and crazy stuff I did, it, uh, they were all dreams, you know, because every night I would meditate, I would visualize, and I would fall asleep in this mindset, and my subconscious would just keep training and would just carry on all the lessons of the day and whatever I was thinking about and because no other data was getting in my head that's what my dreams were about but when you see me fight uh, tomorrow I hit him with that uh, I uh, hit him with that left leg kick and uh, he used to pick it up and kick people down and you know smack them down and kind of do this mochismo thing with it um, and I got him with this I saw it a dream I got him with this kick and he went to push me down. And I did the, the coolest rolling arm bar, just like out of the dream. And so that was the, I had that dream awareness, you know, uh, the first time I applied something that happened in my subconscious to an actual combative moment. And, and that, you know, it's a great fight. And, uh, but that kind of unlocked the next level for, for my, my brain and my, you know, my ability to perform. Frank, oh. it, 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 that's cool. You did it with Tamora and like, not like me, you know, because <laughs> it wouldn't have meant the same. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me write off a couple of these. As I, I got a lot here. So in Alabama, Tank Abbott, he's uh, somebody that comes with a crew that likes to bully people. One of his training partners that went by Big L threw a hamburger at you and you guys got into a fist fight. Yeah. I beat down, I beat down Big Al. I felt bad about it afterwards. Um, 
But yeah, he got to came out all drunk. Um, I was dressed uh, with cowboy boots in a turtleneck. I'm sure you <laughs> looking like a dandy. And uh, he just it, it, three in the morning, morning climbed out of a cab and all drunk just threw this burger at me and then um, started to pursue me, you know, and I, I was telling him this guy's like, hey, you know, back up, you know, and I thought I was friends with those guys because we'd hung out, but they were drunk and egging them on and the whole thing. And so eventually I had to, um, you know, I had to confront him. He grabbed my shirt and I, get, I, did, I did the hockey move where you back out of your shirt. <laughs> I pulled his head down and uh, I hit him six or seven good times. And, Uppercut. <laughs> yeah. And then he fell down. I hit him. I kneed him. And then I think I might have kicked him in the face a few times because I was really upset that he would do that to me. Um, and then I went home and, you know, sleeping, uh, sharing a room with my dad. So I had to kind of sneak in, you know, hide my swollen hand, the whole thing. You know, Shirtless. Uh, the whole <laughs> thing. I'm just trying to, like, get by. I'm just like, oh, man. and And so... But then the next morning, and this is uh, how humanity works, you know, he, Al came up to me with butterfly bandages all over his face, holding his face together. And he said, hey, I'm really sorry about that. I was out of line and I was drunk and I apologize. And had the utmost humility. And I went, wow, that's super powerful because I'd never, I'd never experienced that before. And I was going to kill him if his boys hadn't grabbed him because, you know, I'm, I'm terrified anyways. And. When you mess with a terrified person, they they don't stop. And so that was me. I had no intention of stopping. It's prison too. You know, you've got Yeah. You know, it's there's only one way to handle things like that in the penitentiary and to kind of decipher between the two situations is almost impossible at times. It's hard, yeah. And in prison, you you know, you you have to. Like if you don't, then your own group goes, Oh, well, look at you, and they they take from you. So it's this really weird society, you know, microcosm of society where you're forced to do these things. And if you don't, then you become a bigger victim than you already are. And it's just so horrible. It's like one of the worst things. Yeah, no, for sure. And him coming up to you in prison, that's round two. Yeah, no, no. I mean, in prison, you know, the boys show up next and there's a whole thing that, yeah, I, I, I deeply respected that. And I don't know if I ever told him, I just said, thank you. And, you know, it's okay. But, um, you know, I, I, I gathered data along my journey and I realized in humility and, you know, saying you're sorry, you know, it means a lot because, you know, I was looking to finish him off the next time I saw him and drag him behind a dumpster and, you know, thinking all kinds of horrible stuff because, you know, he, he assaulted me. Um, and the minute he said, I'm sorry, and I was in the wrong, and I, you know, hope you have, it, it, it evaporated. I was like, whoa, it. there you go. Yeah, this is how it works. Oh, yeah. Right? Right? I was like, man, I was like, it's okay. You know, I'm sorry I kicked your face a bunch of times. No hard feelings. We shook hands and walked in different directions. But it taught me something about being a man and, and having the courage to do that. You know, because up until that point, I had never done that, had the courage to do that or seen anybody or had anybody do that to me. Wow. Were you in attendance at U of C3? Who, who fought? Uh, it's when Harold Howard, uh, it, I Chemo, think so. Chemo sure. eliminated Boyce Gracie, um, and Harold Howard advanced, and Ken was supposed to fight Harold Howard. And he decided yeah. not to because it wasn't Hoist in the finals. Yes, yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. What was the conversation like in the background? You know, I, I I don't remember all that much. I just remember Bob and Ken, you know, talking very intently about it, and then Ken coming out and saying, "I'm not doing it." You know, I'm here for Hoist, and you know, he, he was our master. We never questioned why he was doing things. Um, but I could tell Bob was really upset. You know, Bob was not on board. <laughs> Dad was not cool with the whole, you know, pulling out thing. Um, but, you know, that, Ken was one of those guys. Once he made a decision, that was, you know, that's how things rolled. And then either rolled with it or you rolled against him. And, you know, at that time I was carrying his bags and <laughs> keeping him warm. So I did whatever he asked me to do and, and just followed him around. Wow. Wow. 
they bring in black belt. Pancras brings in a black belt, Alan Goez. Uh, he was on the Brazilian judo Olympic team as well. Super talented guy. He's got a gym in California where you're at right now. You guys fought to a draw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I broke his leg. He still, he still teases me about that. Uh, yeah, it was the first time. I mean, Pancrase was so evolved and the Japanese were so good that any time a foreigner came along, we took the month off. Like, it was like, oh, a foreign guy, huh? And we did not take it seriously. So I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know anything about his skill set. I didn't know anything until we locked up. And then I, I realized he was he had a different energy. You know, he was coming to fight, you know, like I was, for your life and, you know, to never to give up. I got him on a hook. I thought he would tap. And he just, no. So I broke his leg. And then afterwards I said, Alan, what, why, why, why would you let – why would you let me do that? You know, because I was, I was in a sporting mindset. And he goes, Frank, I would never give up to a submission hold, ever. My honor is too important to me. And I was like, wow. And I, it took me years to understand, you know, but that was his world. That was his honor. That was his rules. His model. And that's what he believed. In. So, the, the interesting thing about Alan Go is, too, is, is, is Alan's a guy like you from the street, from, you know, from barrio kind of thing you know yeah yeah no and that's what he told me i saw him after he laid up guys and i said why would why and he goes i could never i could never go home i could never look at myself I could, this is this is my honor and and where he came from you you didn't give up you know or he died and so i understood and i respected that alan and i are wonderful friends i just love him he's such a great martial artist you know he's such a good man and father so, yeah, you know, and it taught me something there because I was like, "Ooh, that's, you know, that's another way of thinking that I, I need to adopt some of that if I'm going to do certain things. Look, we got friend Shamrock here. We do not need any more celebrities, but I'm about to let in Chris Lytle. Oh, finally, <laughs> man. Hell yeah. That's good. Let's see where he is. Let's see where he is. Let's see. Let me... Chris, oh man, he's in. There he is. Chris, am, am I early? Got, <laughs> What's happening, Frank? Sorry, so late, man. I thought you. I thought we were on Central Time. Yeah, no worries, brother. It sounds like you're traveling the world, man. Been busy as can be, man. I'll be in out in Albuquerque next weekend, man. It'll be nice. Nice. Yeah, I love Albuquerque. Yeah, how you been, bub? I can't complain. I mean, just living the dream. I just moved down to uh, Carlsbad above San Diego. So, oh. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm living that beach life. I just, I just love it. You know, it's been the past, uh, you know, 14 years have been the best years of my life. With, with uh, Really? Yeah, raising kids and, you know, just, you know, not fighting. That's that's the key. <laughs> At home, we're in the it's kitchen, a grind, right? dude. The fighting's a grind, man. Your life just disappears you don't even know you're like man there's three years went by you know what i mean just training and fighting mm -hmm. that's it it's, it's a weird grind yeah no and it's necessary because you got to stay focused stay on top and you know lives are at stake literally limbs lives you know brain cells are at stake so we were just talking brain about you know i did nothing else i didn't i didn't go out hang out have friends if you weren't fighting training <laughs> you know ready to you know vascular you know workouts at midnight you know, we just didn't hang out because that's that was not my yeah. all-consuming world. Yeah, right. You know, Frank, uh, it, it's funny you talk about that. I, I remember at one point I was training, training. I was working on the fire department the whole time. I had four kids, and uh, I realized, you know, I hurt my knee once after one of my last fights, and um, did some took some time off, which I never took time off. I was always at the gym, so took some time off. Went to my son's basketball games and went to some gymnastics meets and stuff, and then. You know, they called me for my next fight, and I went to the gym, and I felt something I never felt like I shouldn't be here. You know what I mean? I felt guilt. And that then I was like, man, all right, went home and talked, and that was my last fight. I was like, all right, and I had one more fight, and then I retired. And, uh, yeah, you realize you're missing a lot of stuff, you know, so I'm glad to see you're able to do all that stuff. Like, you're doing it now. I try to do it and fight. It was just tough. I miss a lot of stuff, and I, I'm never getting that time back. But I, I learned before it was too late. Yeah. Yeah, that's all that matters. Everyone's journey is different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't, 
you can't do other stuff is the problem and you no, no. must you must become a selfish warrior or you will not be the best it's just how it works so you know it's a it's a sacrifice and you know wow. uh, many people make it and and some regret it and you know but uh you know blessings that you made it through your journey brother you're healthy and your beautiful family and that's Thank you know you. it's about Thanks. right same to you, man. I always like seeing that. But it's just funny. Most people you talk to, they always say, uh, yeah. man, you got to do this. You got to go there. I was like, yeah, you go to all these places. But I'm like, I was in the hotel cutting weight every day. You know, it's like, you, you had a fight over in Japan. Like, I got 12, I got like nine hours after the fight until all my flight left. Oh, I had fun in those eight hours. But I mean, you don't see my, it ain't like people think. It's like, you're not going to Australia, just hanging out and, and seeing the sites like you're, you're training. You know what I mean? Like, different it's not it's not it's not the glamour people think a lot of times yeah yeah i, I wish it was i wish we were rock stars it'd be a lot better <laughs> than make our money that way i've seen more i've seen the back door of more arenas and hotels and, you know stairwells and everything else than yeah. I care. forget <laughs> rock stars man you guys should be soccer stars <laughs> yeah there you go you'll run out. out with the hockey guys i've never been to professional hockey and then um my friend came to San Jose, so we went to a hockey game, and uh, he was um, the broadcaster for the Minnesota Wild. So he, I got to go back and meet all, guys. and they were just wonderful people, great, you know, great community, and and real focused on the sport because they play every night, you know, or three nights a week or whatever they do. But I was really fascinated because as soon as the match was over, you know, they do their rah rah and they skate around a few times and they wave at everybody and they go right in the back and they start riding bikes. And they do 30, 40, 45 minutes of vascular training. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? I thought we were going to party. Like, what's happening? And they're like, wow. no. The guy was explaining the sport to me. It's little short bursts over and over and over. You get all this lactic acid. And if we want to perform tomorrow, this is the maintenance. Wow. And I was like, no way. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. The guys went right from the ice, back riding bikes. Wow. Mike, I'm 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 gonna let you. I'm I'm gonna grab over here. Mike, take over again. Okay. Man, so that's that's a long season, do saw real quick. That so, hockey man, those guys, they play. Oh, those are those are underrated athletes, man, because that is a brutal sport. So fast. So I mean, you got to be a stud just to physically make it through. Those people take a beating, and then they're going to ride bike, right? Huh? I can't skate, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, I was fascinated. And, and what I learned from them was, you know, I never recovered. I, I wrestled for an hour and then lay on the mat and fall asleep, you know, because I'd be tired, <laughs> so tired. And I'd wake up in a giant puddle of sweat, you know, with something <laughs> around me. Um, and that's just what we did because I didn't know you that that existed. I didn't know you needed to do that. So when I saw that, I, I was super curious and I asked them and, and, what I took from that was, you know, there is a post recovery thing that needs to be done. Uh, and, and after seeing that, you know, I added that to my, you know, to my training routine. Now, you know, a couple of nights later, they didn't have to do all that. And they were off for a little while. So we went out and drank beers. But you know, in the beginning, that's right to it. Man, Frank, I mean, you got to be thinking we were in the, no, you were more in the absolute stone age. I was a few <laughs> years back after that, which mine wasn't much better, but it was, I mean, you were almost just like taking two sticks and rubbing them together, trying to make fire. You know what I mean? You guys were creating how to do this stuff. And a lot of it, I think, was just going hard all the time, which looking back probably wasn't the best way. But that's all I did, too. I didn't know there's ways to do things smarter, but you just didn't know it back then. And you guys were just known for being hard nosed, man. So I, I, I appreciate that. But it's, it's good to find better ways, I think. Yeah, for certain. And, you know, like I was telling the boys, uh, I came up with a really unique mindset, you know, first I was desperate, I had nothing else. Uh, <laughs> you know, I had, I'd spent three and a half years building up my body, which nobody has time to do that. You know, just, you know, just nothing but focus on the, you know, building a big, huge structure. Um, but I'd say that, and then the two biggest things, I didn't have any martial arts. I didn't know how to wrestle. I'd never done anything. So I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And that was really valuable. Um, because everyone else had something and they would fall back on that or they would go, yeah, but what, but I, but I was taught this. Um, and so it was easy for me to 
you know, move information in and move information out. You know, if it didn't work, then I got hurt doing it. You know, we got rid of it. Like that was it. <laughs> and then the one thing I say was was my biggest, you know, value, and I still do it today in business, is I could read people. And I could read early on. You know, I'd ask a question and people wouldn't know the answer. Nobody knew the answer. And, you know, they'd either say, you know, they'd either ignore me or they'd beat me up for asking it. But what I realized was there's huge opportunity here in that nobody knows and nobody has the courage to say it. And then no one has the courage to figure out the truth. And so, you know, I became the nerd guy with the notebook trying to trying to figure it out. And, you know, I got to be honest, with you, nobody liked it. No one liked me. You know, I was a nerd and there were no nerds in the space at that time. There were no smart thinkers. Um, but that was my, you know, my opportunity. I had a great you know, foundation of discipline from, from being in prison and, you know, studying, and, you know, trying to learn stuff and, you know, applying that to a new sport. And this is what I tell people in business. You got something new? Lean in. <laughs> no one knows what they're doing if it's mm -hmm. brand. And there's your opportunity. Wow. So you bounced around quite a bit, getting different looks from different people. You actually worked out with the Raw team with Rico Ch uh, Ciaparelli in the past. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. What was that experience like? Oh man, it was fantastic. I, I, I hadn't um let me see. I hadn't met wrestlers of that finesse, like that super high level uh, high level knowledge. And you know, I think by then I, you know, wrestled the Penn State team and I, you know, wrestled a bunch of old guys at Stanford and you know, I was wrestling tough, tough guys, but um they had a different knowledge and, and understanding and skill set. And, and that fascinated me because, you know, you, you miss this, Chris, but I'm a terrible wrestler. I still am a terrible wrestler. Most high school wrestlers will just beat me. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I was telling this story yesterday, bro. Someone was saying, you're such a great wrestler. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> and then they were asking me about the Igor Zenobia fight. They're yeah. like, hey, man, you took that dude down. I could tell you knew how to wrestle. I was like, bro, I got one move, you saw it, and now everyone thinks I could wrestle. Um, but the, the backstory of that move is I was wrestling a 17-year-old kid in Dallas, Texas, because I was out seeing Guy Mesger and hanging out, and I can't remember what I was doing. And some kid bounds in on his lunch break from high school, and he's like, hey, yo, you want to wrestle? And I was studying wrestling. So I said, man, I'd love to wrestle with you. So we get going, and he's just destroying me at one point. I um, grabbed his head like in a guillotine and he scooped me up and stovepiped me right on my shoulder. So I, <laughs> I was stuck there for two hours. He's, I, I was like, eh, he like knocked everything out of me, you know, uh, jacked me up. I had to crawl under a desk and, and recover, you know, for two hours. Um, but I took that wrestling move and did it to Igor Sinovio. Wow. Because he told me, I go, how'd you do that? Because I'm like, how'd you do that? As I could barely breathe. And he's like, bro, you can never grab the head like that. <laughs> and I touched Zenobia, and I'm like, wait, he grabs the head every time. And so wrestling with this kid, I can't remember his name. He's literally a 17-year-old kid who destroyed me, destroyed me. And um, I took that knowledge, and I won a title with it. Wait, so let me ask you though. Know, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Let me get this. God, Mike. Do you think? Do you think John Peretti brought Zenobia in with the specific intent to beat you? Because Zenobia, it was his extreme fighting champion. It was his guy. Same yeah, question, well, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I mean, arguably, at that time, we were the best in opposing leagues. Like that was, you know, he he had a different style and a different, you know, strengths and structure. But at that time, we were the best. So, you know, I'm sure, you know, somebody was trying to beat me. But, you know, I was in that phase where no one was going to beat me. I was willing to die. And, you know, you match those two up with my discipline and my focus. And just nobody, there was nobody even in my league. Did you ever hang out with him afterward? <laughs> well, years later, this is a funny story. I felt bad about it. You know, for years, I felt bad. And, and I always, you know, I didn't have the courage to reach out to him. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to say. I, I thought I killed him. Guys, when he hit the mat, my head, because I drove my shoulder through him, because I was the technique. And I could hear all of his bones breaking, shoulder bone. Oh. 
Like it sounded like I was jumping on a bag of chicken bones. Oh. Dead guys. I got up and I'm doing the pose, but inside I'm going, man, I just killed this sport. What am I going to do next? Like, this is not where we're supposed to be at. So I was happy he got up, but I literally felt bad for five or six years. And then I sat with him during the IFL. We had dinner, an investor dinner. And I just happened to be right next to the guy. And I turned to him and I go, he go, man, I'm, I, I want to apologize. I'm sorry. You know, I, I didn't, mean to, didn't mean to do that. And he just laughs. He laughs. Like, big belly laugh. He goes, oh, he goes, what are you talking about? It's a fight. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, oh, man, it's all me. It's all me. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you, you know he would have done the same thing to you if he could have. You know what I mean? So totally. it was all me. It's you know I felt that way. He didn't. You know, and so yeah. taught me something about life. You know, I respected. I respected. <laughs> you know, there's a risk. We take it. Let, 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 let me ask you a question about that specific fight because I'm a matchmaker. I'm a fan. You know, that was a Peretti made fight. That was John Peretti made. What were your thoughts on Peretti? Like, was was he coming after you, or was he bringing matchmakers for you know to build you up? What what were your thoughts on him? I I didn't I didn't have thoughts. He seemed like a nice guy. You know, I came from the streets. I never trusted anybody. You never trusted <laughs> anybody's word. I never trusted anything. And if I couldn't see it, touch it, feel it, prove it, and it wasn't a benefit to me, it didn't. I didn't stick. And that's just how I went about things. Um, and then once I realized I was the only nerd in the room and I, my, my thinking was way ahead of everybody else, that's when I was able to, you know, take control of my career. And, you know, it didn't matter to me who called. I would call them. I'd be like, listen, I'll fight your champ. I'll give you a discount. But here's what I need. And they'd all say yes. <laughs> so they didn't know what I knew in business. And in fighting, and you know, it's, I had a, an advantage that they didn't even know existed yet. So Zinoviev, for those at home, he was 4-0-1-2, captain of the Russian judo team, um, secret service, like one of the, you know, KGB from Russia, and ended up Jeffrey Epstein's bodyguard for a while. He used to take Jeffrey around. So, oh, a good guy. guy. <laughs> interesting guy. So back to Japan, they give you Takuke Fuke, and then they rematch you against again with Boss Rutten. With Boss Rutten, there was a rumor, well, I shouldn't say rumor, it was confirmed through, through uh, Jason Delucia, that Jason did like a Wiccan spell on a piece of paper to give it to Boss to kind of put a hex on him. Could you open up about that? I don't know anything about it. Jason was a kind of a weird out. Uh, what, what do you call it? Um, outward, outworldly guy. Meaning he lived in different worlds. And he, <laughs> a hippie. A hippie yeah. and, uh... I'd never experienced that in a person before. And, and he was also a serious martial artist and, and a badass. And so yeah. I respected it and it was different and it was odd. But I, you know, I, I didn't really get it. And I, I, I liked his vibe, though. He had a great energy and he really believed in the study of martial arts and the study of things. And that's where, you know, that's where our friendship really matured because I was on the same mission. And so, you know, we were both looking for the truth. We just had different ideas of the worlds we were living in at the time. But he was a fascinating guy, you know, um, oh, yeah. uh, he, astrology. Like, he was in all kinds of crazy stuff that I didn't I knew nothing about. So I found it fascinating. I found it really interesting. Um, and he opened my eyes to some crazy stuff because I didn't know all that stuff was going on in the world. <laughs> the guy took the Gracie Challenge pre-UFC 1. Yeah. Yeah, he was like, you know? he was a real, he believed, you know, uh, Wushu Kung Fu, like he believed that was the way. And he, he you got know, beat he up took... by Hoist Gracie in yeah. 1992 <laughs> yeah. before yeah. UFC. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It, it changed his life because he went. He, when that happened to him, he went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe I'm not on the right path. Maybe there's more. And that set him on his journey. And that's how he ended up at, at yeah. the line. So but he when was I one used... of those guys who believed, as we all did back, if you had a style, that my style was superior. And, you know, he, proved, he went to prove it and went, okay, wait a minute. 
there's more <laughs> to be answered. <laughs> so, so when I was doing my research on him, and it's one of our best interviews we've ever done, there's old message boards from you know 20 years ago where people are like, <laughs> yeah, he was in high school, laid down 500 bucks, beat up a guy in the gym. He pretty much would like dojo storm, you know, like within the Massachusetts area. I mean, the guy, yeah. he, he just wanted to fight. I got a ton of respect for him. Yeah, he yes. wanted to, you know, he he went on the same journey I went on. He wanted to prove what he was doing was right, valuable, you know, important, you know, the, the thing. And that that's what, you know, kept, you know, the UFC alive. That's what kept this sport growing was martial artists on this journey. You know, what, what, what do I do now? And when I started teaching, I, I wasn't a martial artist, so I didn't, I didn't understand. But when I started sharing the knowledge, that's when I started seeing how it affected people like it affected Jason. I had one of my students named Dusty, who was a 40 year karate veteran. And I taught for him and he was lovely and his people were lovely. And he pulled me aside and he goes, well, what do I do now? I got to quit martial arts and do something different. I go, what are you talking about? I was like, what, 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 what? And he's like, well, I've been doing it wrong. You know, <laughs> what I'm doing isn't, isn't right. And I was like, no, you, it is right. Because you're teaching a martial art and this is your culture and this is your thing. And you're, it's not about fighting. It's about people's journey and improving and having a mission and having a purpose and having a culture and having something to study. And I told him, I just happened to be at the tip of this other study that's going to become the next big thing and what you should do to service your people is teach them this stuff and he went okay <laughs> he was back in again <laughs> but he was like jason he was deeply affected by the experience now jason jason in our interview said and and he was very 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 humble about it he said i had trained a martial a world champion and never got credit for it and then when we kind of pressured him about it, he said, look, you know, I, I, I don't want to belittle, you know, Frank did other things and stuff, but I was with Frank for so long. I mean, give Jason some props. Yeah, got to. No, oh, he's a great martial artist. Yeah, and he was my training partner forever and ever. Yeah. Yeah, he was a great guy. And uh, yeah, it now, is what now, it is. Do you think you would have been a champion without him? I would have been a champion with nothing more than my mind and this pencil. Okay. That's excellent. And, 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 and I know Jason will accept that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And, it's, and, you know, from six months of training and beating Bass Root in your first fight, I don't think anybody can really call that comment into question. I do. <laughs> no, I mean, no, he, it's, it's true. And, yeah. And he was a far better grappler, a far better striker, a far better martial artist. He, he was far more advanced than I was for a long time until I left the lion's den. And, and, and know, to Jason's he, credit, Jason will say that you became far beyond him. Yeah. So yeah. he's yeah, yeah. a very humble guy. But Yeah, he is. He's a great he's a great martial artist and a great friend and yeah, I loved having him there because he like I said he opened my eyes to martial I didn't know what martial arts was. I you know, I watched Chuck Norris and and <laughs> That's what I, yeah, that was it, you know? That's what martial arts was to me, uh, TV stuff. So, but to see someone living it, to see someone breathing it, bleeding it, and and willing to go in and test it, I wasn't that guy. <laughs> it wasn't me, you know, I was yeah. fighting to survive. I was fighting to, to, you know, just to live. I wasn't on some martial journey. Right, so you had mentioned you really fully developed and became that of unto yourself when you left the lion's den. I've got like a crazy theory. At UFC 8, Gary Goodrich fights Jerry Bolander. Yeah. Jerry's announced, managed by Ken, trained by Frank. Was there a little bit of a tug of war there with Jerry Bolander between you and Ken? I don't know. I just did what I was told, to be honest with you. And that, you know, at the time, it was Ken's way or no way. So I just, you know, uh, I, after about six or seven months, you know, I was, I, I learned that no one was taking notes. No one was writing it down. No one was memorizing. No one was, you know, thinking about programs and, and I'd run 400, you know, convicts in prison. It was natural for me to run things in program format and to teach people how to train and do stuff. You know, I ran weightlifting crews in prison. So 
you know, I organically just through process became a leader and became a teacher. And, um, you know, did that bother Ken? Was Ken, you know, upset by that? Who knows? Most likely. But, <laughs> you know, the reason why I left was it just, I could see that the, the focus was elsewhere. It wasn't on the study. It wasn't on the development. What, you know, it was old ideas with, you know, old structures. And because I was running around and meeting all these martial artists and all these different communities with wonderful old cultures and ideas that had value, I started to question the values of this new culture I was in. And that was the core for me. I was like, oh, this is just who I want to become. And I realized so, that. What was the culture you, like that, that you said you were learning, um, that you had learned, you were going off of, you questioned, was that like all the old <laughs> Pancrase Japanese style was that was that more that style that you were talking about? No, no, no. It, it was really philosophical and then mechanical. You know, okay. I could, I could just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing everything down. I'm drawing diagrams. I'm, yeah. I'm the nerd. And when you match that up with some of the education and direction, it just wasn't making sense. You know, and then when you ask a question, you get beat up. And that was a culture that I saw to be less valuable and less growth oriented. You know, it was good for Ken, but it wasn't good for everybody else because, sure. they, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times I raised my hand, asked a question, got my ass kicked, which is imagine if you were at work and that happened. Imagine if you were at school as an elementary student, you're like, excuse me, and then you get, you get beat up. Yeah. Uh, it's not a way to learn. It's a way to control. It's a way to guide a certain way. But it's not a good way to learn. And I wasn't learning. I was learning more by wrestling with people, studying wrestling books, talking to people than I was in from my teacher. Now, so, when, so it's, in it's California, a good way to... you, I'm sorry, Mike, but in California, you got the Lions Den way, but there are a plethora of other schools. Did you delve? Did you go see? Like, for example, there's a great story about... Ken taking Funaki to the Machado school and how it didn't go well with them. Uh, do you have any experiences like that? Um, well, I was sent to a few, uh, I was sent to one school when, um, when Ken was fighting Hoist again, I was commissioned to learn jujitsu because I was the smart nerdy one. So I was sent to a uh, Goker Javinchian school in Los Angeles. Me and uh, Yushi and Nagasawa went there and spent what, six weeks or something. Um, and, you know, I was the first time I'd really been exposed to it and then invited into the culture. And so I, you know, showed up, suited up, did whatever they did. Um, but I just quickly realized, like, you know, athleticism, you know, I saw the difference between what would be considered a passive martial art and an aggressive martial art. And that was the big difference for me because I realized if I'm just aggressive, I can you know, outmove, overpower, overwork, you know, fatigue, like I can just out outwork these people. And that's what real combat is about. First person to get tired, lose focus, lose concentration, you know, miss a punch. They're the ones that get hurt. And so for me, I, I just, I saw the differences in the system. They were lovely and they treated me lovely. And I'm sure they tried to beat me, but, you know, I was, un, you know, I undeterred because I didn't really care. I, I was there to get the knowledge. And the knowledge was important to me. I was on an important mission. My master said, go learn jujitsu. And then I came back with this oversimplified version. Of, <laughs> All right, here's how it works. Here's what you got to do. And that's it. Wow. They thought I was crazy. Like, that yeah, can't be that easy. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, <"No." laughs> I, okay. Yes, here's the data. <laughs> All right. So behind the scenes, you're talking about how studious you are, or, you know, how much you pay attention. The UFC brass obviously noticed this about you immediately, Bob Myrowitz and yeah. Art Davy. In your opinion, do you think that they really didn't like Mark Coleman like as their champion? Like they had a little bit of an axe to grind against him? Yeah, I don't. You know, I think it was just circuit. Wrestlers were better at beating people up at that time because of superior. <laughs> I wrestled with them. They would kick my ass. I'd be like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> this is just terrible. You know, and it didn't matter what martial art you knew, wrestling was more dominant at that time because we didn't know how to wrestle. And so if you were good, you're willing to thump on people, you could be very successful. So I don't think it was an axe to grind with anybody. 
I think they wanted Kevin Jackson to win, to be honest with you, when I fought for the UFC championship because he was the gold medalist. He was the undefeated guy. You know, he was the perfect spokesman. I was a knucklehead. Um, but they needed me because we, we were doing UFC Japan. So, you know, I got my role. I knew why I was there. But it didn't mean I wasn't going to beat him and wasn't going to fulfill my side of, you know, my journey. Uh, but so, yeah, so- I don't, yeah, Bob fell in love with me and I love Bob. He's a great man. But I don't think, you know, at the beginning, I, I don't think that was their intention. Yeah, Coleman, uh, Coleman was like a little brass. Was- I'm just going to say, at that time in the UFC, you got Coleman, and, you know, Coleman is a Hall of Famer. But you're kind of like a 2.0. You know, you're, you're kind of like a better package. You're a little better spoken. a little, You know, and I, I'm, I love yeah. Mark. You know, he's a friend of mine. Did you ever feel that transition, you know, heading towards you? Did, did, did you ever feel it not? you know, not click and stuff. Because then after that, you had Dan Henderson coming in and Couture and other people. And it was like, you know, you kind of fell back kind of quickly. Like you didn't get enough of a chance. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, my focus was training, winning and and doing my best. And then, you know, one of the things that, you know, is both a blessing and a curse is I did the greatest things ever with the smallest audience that ever existed. <laughs> yeah. Once we lost, we lost ninety percent of the audience. And so we, you know, I was doing, I was setting Guinness World Records when nobody was watching, and, <laughs> and it was, I, I was still happy, and I was still getting paid, and I was still achieving my dream, um, and and so that's the curse. The blessing is, I was the first spokesman for the UFC. Yeah. You know, Bob is like, listen, we got to get back on cable. Go figure it out. And so I would go around and talk to all the commissions and the cable carriers and meet with the people and, you know, go to the events and, and wear my suit and tell my story because I believed in what we were doing. To me, that was more important. And the rest of it, you know, th- that stuff can't be controlled. But what can be controlled was my fighting. And then, you know, what I thought was most important, which was, hey, if we don't get back on television. I'm done. I got to get yeah. out of this and get a real job or do something else. Uh, now, Frank, I got I to disagree with you about one thing. You're just talking about how wrestlers doing everything just a little bit better. And I, I totally agreed with that. I thought that was it. And I, I honestly thought when you went in to face Tito Ortiz, he was going to maul you and destroy you. And he, he that fight right there was made me say, dude, I was in all of you after that. I mean, he, he, he did exactly what he thought. He took you down. He patted on you for the first five minutes. And I was just like, man. This is ugly. And then just just that victory made me like, for a while I thought, remember like Mark Kerr and Mark Coleman, those guys were never going to lose. I just didn't understand how they could happen. I, I, I was new into fighting. And like when you were able to withstand the Tito thing and come back on top, that really opened my eyes. That was, uh, you said they were just better, but not this time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, when I, I, I preface that by just saying, if you line all martial arts up, wrestling is by far the oh, most fundamental necessary skill for beating the hell out of somebody in this type of sport street fighting all that stuff and at that time when honestly nobody knew anything chris i used to look people in the eye and they'd tell me the crazy <laughs> things and i'd be like nope that man's lying to me <laughs> <laughs> i'd be like he doesn't know the truth because nobody knew the truth <laughs> and and you know the truth is at that time if you had you know, college wrestling, if you had a strong base of ground control and ground and pound, you were a bad dude to be reckoned with. And I wrestled with all those guys all over the world. So I understood what they could do. And I had to build systems around it because I never was at that caliber. You know, I had the same wrestling coach for nearly 20 years. And he was, um, I got him because when I signed the fight with Kevin Jackson, his name is Eric Deuce. And uh, he's a middle school uh, wrestling coach now. When I met him, he was doing assistant coaching at Stanford. Ooh. And uh, so I look at Kevin Jackson's wrestling record, and it's like 902. And there's only two guys in the world that have beaten him or something. And Eric Deuce was one of those guys. Uh. So martial artist, I pick up the and I go, oh, and he's right here in Stanford. So I pick up the phone and I call him. 
and they say, hey, man, this is what's going on, da, 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 whatever. And he goes, oh, yeah, come down and train. Martial artist, judo guy, you know, real deal. And I said, come down and train. I'll teach you how to wrestle. He was my coach for 20 years. The closest I ever got him was on his hip. <laughs> so, 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 Frank, you worked out with Tito Ortiz. That was UFC 22. You came in as an underdog. Uh, walked out by TK and Maurice Smith. You guys had the alliance at that point. Um, you are cardio, Tito. Was that yeah. the game plan going into that fight? Yeah, I really had two strategies um, for Tito. You know, I was coming out of it, and, I, and I, I was having these lucid dreams. Like, I was observing myself as a third person while training and having a conversation with my coach or myself. I don't really know. But what because I was only focused on that, and because every night, you know, I would use meditation and visualization skills before I fell asleep. I would literally just end up right back in the gym again. Only this time, I, I would be able to observe myself and have a conversation with somebody, I'm not sure who it was, and, and comment on things that I would never see before. And so when I fought Tito, this is the Tito strategy, um, I'd never fought in someone that big before with good wrestling skills and good understandings. And so I had one, two, uh, I had a two-pronged plan First one, I was going to turn my back to him, knowing he would lift me up and I'd catch his leg. Watch the fight again. It's really hard to catch. But I was going to sucker him in to a rolling arm bar because I knew he'd never seen it. And I knew every wrestler at that time, when they hit their base, they put their arms out and they went to all fours. So I knew I could pull him into a comfortable position and he'd have no understanding of what was happening. And so if you watch the fight, you'll see exactly that in the first 30 seconds. And then, um, you know, he, he was just too strong. He ripped right out of it. <laughs> and then plan B, plan B was I was going to ride him like a horse until he threw up. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I knew his skill set. <laughs> I, I knew what he knew. I knew what he didn't know. And I knew that he hadn't been exposed <laughs> like I hadn't when I was young to, you know, really hardcore vascular training and understanding how to work inside of the inside of the game right like he was just fighting he was doing his best for as long as possible but if you watch the fight every 30 seconds i pop up every you know at the end of every one. round i heard him. Yeah. yeah i make him think about it and so you know if you're on the other side it's a never-ending battle that you don't know how to end mm -hmm. and that's wanted him psychologically because i knew he's, he's a very psychologically tough man like he's been through you know wars and he's been through hell his, you know his childhood you know he grew up like me and we were friends so i knew how tough he was and how hungry he was at that time and i had to get him over that i had to get him past you know all that stuff and that was physical attrition i mean you know uh, fatigue makes cowards out of men and us all so <laughs> i took him there Let's, Let me I, I got, question. I got, hold on, we go, we go. Wait, we got to stay on this. Hold up. So, Tito Ortiz, you retire right after that fight. Was that to get out of your UFC contract? What was the reason behind that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd taken a mentor. So this is what um, this is the history. Still, my mentor to this day, Henry Holmes. He's like my father because my all my fathers have passed, including Bob. Rest in peace. Um, you know, after I won my first UFC title, I literally won it. It was actually 14 seconds, but they didn't never stop the clock because everyone was so shocked. And, you know, I came home. I'm, I'm the UFC champion in the, in the, with the smallest viewed audience that ever existed. <laughs> so I go. So I, I was dating a girl in Los Altos, Angelina, who became my second wife. And um, her, uh, her dad, Al Seahorn, had one rule. You can stay at my house, but don't get in my bed. And so one day he comes home early and catches me in the bed with Angelina and uh, calls me out for a dad talk. And he sits me down, looks me in the eye, you know, right at the kitchen table. And he's like, what are your intentions? What are you doing? What's your journey? What's your mission? And I tell him, oh, man, I'm going to become the greatest fighter in the world. And I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And then I'm going to get out. And I'm going to go make movies. And that's what I'm doing. And I, I love your daughter and that's, and we're good. And so he says, well, there's only one man in the world that I know who has done things like that. His name is Henry Holmes. 
this is his number. See if you can get a meeting. And that's what I did. I called him up. Called, wow. called him. Yeah, it took me like three weeks. I flew to L.A. while in training camp. And he took a hour meeting with me. And I showed him my contract. And here's exactly what he said. Love your story. Love your mission. You're not going to do any of those things inside of this contract. <laughs> <laughs> How, and then he how gave me the was my rules. Yeah, he gave me the second best lesson of my life. He says, What's your where's your line? I go, What do you mean? He goes, Do we have any negotiating power? I go, What do you mean? He goes, Can you say no and walk away? And I go, No, it's all my money. This is everything. I go, I don't have anything else. I got all these felonies, I got all these issues. And he said, Well, when you get the money to afford me and you're ready to draw a line, you come back and talk to me. And so that took me a few more fights to both afford him and then get the courage and understanding that, uh, you know, I could do it. And so I became a free agent. I didn't re-sign my original UFC contract. I let it expire, you know, after my fights. You and remember went, what they offered you? What what they offer you? Uh, I don't know. I know I fought Tito for uh, what, uh, 30 and 30. I only made 60 out of it and it cost me 23 to pay uh, to, to train for it. Um, wow. Yeah. 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 Um, but what, what happened was, is I was, I told Henry, I said, listen, I, I, I can do this. And so I started going around and fighting in the other shows and keeping, you know, basically, you know, winning other organizations and keeping my brand going. And, you know, at that time I was the hottest guy in the world. And so when Bob came back and he's like, Hey, the new guy's Tito and, you know, we want you to fight him and sign a multi-fight contract. I said, okay. Um, and I brought it to Henry and he goes, oh yeah, it's perfect. They'll never see this coming. We're going to put in a line that says, should you ever publicly retire and renounce your championship? The rest of this contract is null and void. <laughs> so that's why I win. I, 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 cause the whole thing was a plan. I was like, I'm getting out. I just need the money from the Tito fight to move to the uh -huh. next one. And so I, that's why when it's over, you see me go, hey, Bob, and I'm out. Here's your belt. Thank you very much. And that's how I was able to become a free agent and, and break my Did contract. they try to renegotiate? Like, what were the conversations like with Myra Woods after? Oh, like, dude, Bob was the OG, man. He took it like a champ. No, because it was business, you know, and he, he accepted the risk at the beginning, which was no one's going to do that. But I did that because I had my business plan that I was following with Henry's advice. And, um, you know, no one saw it coming because who yeah, does? Yeah. Bob fucked up in that, uh, you know, he thought he knew Tito would win. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone did. In fact, my own, this is the only time this happened to my own right. father who always believed yeah. in me. But you know, the really smart guys, Frank, you know this, the really smart guys play both ends. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like I, he put all his eggs in one basket. Yeah, But I wanted to ask you one thing, because we mentioned a name here that is dear to my heart, and that's Maurice Smith. Oh, yeah. So so at some point, you went... Wait, 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 wait Miguel, Miguel go ahead, before, we go, before we go down that line, let me just finish up with Tito. I, I apologize. I don't you want do, to keep like, myself right around. Now. But we're getting I, back I, I to apologize. Maurice. All right, so Dana White was managing Tito Ortiz at this time. Yeah. Did you guys have any, what, is this like when the bad blood started? No, no, no. He was lovely. He used to carry Tito's bag and was just a sweet, you know, <laughs> thing man. And, you know, um, but like a good businessman, he was studying the, the weaknesses of the sport and what was going on. And, you know, he, he, you know, took that back to his very powerful and rich friends and they were able to make a move on the business. But yeah, when I met him, he was a cardio kickboxing guy who was managing Tito and he was really nice and, you know, very polite to everybody. And yeah, the bad blood started when they bought it because I was a martial artist. I, you know, I tell the truth. I follow, you know, I follow what what's real and what's important. And, you know, when they bought the UFC, they hired me as a consultant. And so I went there. I trained Dana. I trained Lorenzo. And I taught them about the business because they were the new owners. And, uh, you know, I was there for two weeks. I stayed for two weeks in Las Vegas at the uh, station casinos with my then third wife. And, um, and it was lovely. I trained them every morning and every night we talked business and branding. 
Um, but after, you know, about 10 days, uh, you know, Dana hurt Lorenzo on day one or two, and then Lorenzo was out. So then I would just meet with the, with the boys at night. Um, but like day 10, they roll out this, you know, we're going to buy USA Today cover, like all these full page ads. And they have Tito all greased up like a, you know, like a playboy uh, guy and all this stuff. And, and so they're like, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, we're going to be very successful. And what do you think? And I go, guys, I go, listen, I've been the brand spokesman for this sport for a long time. I've talked to every cable owner, CEO, athletic dude, this, that, and the other. And it's the sport's damning. We can't just shine it up and roll it back out there. There's more work to like, we need to do a little more. And they, they didn't like that. They didn't agree with it. They carried on in their mission and I separated, um, you know, but after that, I didn't trust them because I realized no matter how much I told them or taught them, they didn't really understand what was going on at the time. And it was too big of a risk for me to risk my name, my body, my life with these guys that just didn't get it. So, you know, we or get, and then I became, you know, then I founded Strike Force and I was, you know, the I was a very hot commodity in every other league but their own. So I became, a, you know, I became the outside man. And then when, <laughs> I, oh, well, I told them and they went a different direction. They lost like $20 million off the bat. They were going to sell it because they went some. I was like, I don't know, you hired me as a consultant. I don't agree. Uh, but, you know, that's, that was that. Well, in, no. in your book, you, you state that, you tell you tell Dana. I mean, I think you referred to him as a wannabe pimp, and that, <laughs> and that you would never ever fight to him. Like you were very direct with him in regards to that. Where did that come from? Well, I just, you know, Bob was a different character. Bob understood music. He understood talent. He took the time to develop a relationship. I'm still friends with Bob to this day. He's like eighty, he's almost ninety years old, and we're still friends because he took the time to touch my heart as a human being. And, you know, like one time he called me up, he says, uh, listen, uh, you know, I got an opportunity for you to fight Buster Douglas. <laughs> hey girl, Buster Douglas, but I say, really? I go, isn't he like huge? And he goes, oh yeah, it's like 400 pounds. I go, oh man, that's terrible, Bob. Was, and so he goes, can you beat him? I go, absolutely, Bob. You know, it's, it, it, it would be an easy fight. Um, I go, but you know, he, you know, I, I can't let him hit me. And he goes, well, he goes, what would happen if uh, Buster Douglas hit me? I go, Bob, he would kill me. <laughs> yeah. And Bob was like, wow, okay. And he, but you could talk to him like a human being and it wasn't, he was real. He was a real guy. And, and that touched me and I trusted him. And so I went and did those things for him. You know, he called me one time. He said, listen, we just lost all cable and this is all that I can pay you. And it's not as much as I promised. And I was like, Hey, Bob, that's business. I understand. I trust you. And I believe, you know, I believe we can do something. And this is important. And so I just didn't get that from Dana. You know, Dana had a different approach. And I saw the differences when he came into power than when he was Tito's manager and he was carrying bags and being nice to everybody and being kind. And, and I was like, oh, he's a little shyster. That's what he does. But mm -hmm. I grew up on the streets. You don't trust people that show you two faces and that act a certain way. And I, so I never trusted him. So I would never give the most valuable resource that I own and the biggest asset that I own, which is my body and my skills. Yeah. But, but Frank, let me ask you though, that's got to feel like a dirty move on his part to go ahead and, and, and give the Tito spot to your brother. No. Um, I, I don't know. It's business. I don't know. How, I don't know what decisions were made and I could care less because once I left, and decided not to work with them, I went a different direction. You know, we had financing from Japan and a great partnership. We started Strike Force. And then the Strike Force thing just made things worse because I started a rival league. <laughs> and that, you know, instantly I was for, I was on the other side of the fence before. And then that built just new fences. So you know uh, well, but let's let's talk about that strike force. It, it was Shamrock versus Gracie. Yeah. And it, broke like the indoor attendance record. Yeah. North American live attendance record, 15,265 seats. 
Yeah. That's insane. That's insane. So Maury Smith, uh, I'll wait for Miguel to get back. But let's let's check up a couple more uh, fights from Japan. December 14th, 1996. You fight Vernon White, Tiger White. Oh. Was this, what precipitated this? Is this right when you left to form the Alliance? What, what happened there? You know, I don't know what happened or why I was fighting him. It was pitched to me that we're professional fighters. Sometimes you got to do this. Um, I don't know if there was some internal politics. I didn't know. I just did what I was told. Um, but I felt bad at that. It's the first time I'd ever had to compete against an opponent. And, um, you know, Vernon was a great striker and a great martial artist. Um, but, you know, I think, the, you know, like many people who, you know, when you seek knowledge and you get a beating instead, I think, you know, it kind of had that whip dog syndrome. And so I knew I could beat him. I knew psychologically I was, you know, miles ahead, you know. Were you at the Lions at the time or did you, did you have left at that point? No, no, I was still there. Yeah, no, we were like, it was the weirdest thing because we were teammates and all of a sudden, you know, we had to compete against each other, which at that time was unheard of. Like you just didn't, you know, we didn't do that. What? That's so strange. <laughs> I'm sure there was some other something going on, but I wasn't a part of it. I just thought Ken was like, listen, there's what you got to do. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go do the thing. You think this is Ken kind of know. playing with pieces on the chessboard? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably, you know. I, I, if I can, I, I'd like to go back to the Alliance, though. So at some point, you're in the UFC. You're coming along. You're still Lions Den. You know, you got Bolander, you got Petey Williams, you got, uh, you know, I, I, Alex Andrade, Guy Mesger. You guys are the premier team. And then all of a sudden, there was one UFC that you and Maurice showed up as the alliance. And and Petey and Jerry kind of were like off to the side, like, like there wasn't a, a lot of union there. How did that whole thing come about in your end like how, how'd that come about oh yeah well once i decided to leave the lion's den i was given the you're with us or against us speech so you know unfortunately in that you know in that culture if you weren't on the team then you were against the team well, and, was that ken talking to you or bob yeah 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 that was ken and nobody was allowed to train with me and you know i left everybody my whole family all the teammates you know, once I decided to leave, I they weren't allowed to train with me, talk to me, help me in any way. And I was their teacher because Ken, you know, bless his heart, was not a very good teacher or a very focused or disciplined teacher. And I was I had all the knowledge. So I happily gave it to my boys and my, you know, my teammates and stuff. But, yeah, when, when I left, you know, it's it's my way or the highway. Nobody talks to Frank. So, uh you know, I just started over and we started with the Alliance because Maurice Smith, who comically, um, <laughs> he was in and needed to do a kickboxing match. So he cut a deal with Maurice. And the deal was, hey, you train me in kickboxing and I'll train you in submission wrestling. So Maurice trains Ken. And then when it came time to reciprocate, Ken goes, all right, Frank, you do the work and train Maurice. <laughs> Were you, were you surprised a little bit more of the, the guys from the Lions didn't, didn't say, well, I mean, our teacher's leaving. I'm following him. You know what I mean? I, and I'm kind of surprised a lot of people were just like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go with where the knowledge is. I, I don't care about this name brand. Lions didn't let them mean as much as me winning fights. I need to go train with, with Fred. Were you surprised more people didn't follow you? Well, yeah, I was surprised and hurt. But yeah. I, I, I grew up you know, broken and broken homes and, you know, all this other stuff. So it was just another, you know, added, added pain, um, you know, and, and that it was coming from my own family, you know, made it even worse, but, um, you know, I respected them because, you know, like I said, I'm your master is your master. You follow the master. I know, but not even from a loyalty standpoint, but from a, like, you know, a, a good choice. It's like, I'm, I'm following the guy who's teaching me what to do. You know, it's like, yeah. this is the guy who helps me. I don't, you know, I, I just think it was a entrant, like a weird choice. You think they're just from a selfish standpoint, they'd have followed you like, Hey, I, I need this guy. 
Yeah. Well, the result was I went to the American Kickboxing Academy, which at yeah. the time was a kickboxing academy, and turned them to the preeminent martial arts training group who trained all these world champions. So that's yeah, unfortunate that those people didn't come and that they didn't find more success, you know, yeah. staying where they were. But that's, you know, th that's how life works. You make those choices based on, you know, what's important to you. And what was important in that culture was loyalty, following directions and doing things the way the master did it, which is, you know, a lot of a lot of martial arts operate that way. Yeah. Um, now, Maurice and I got close because you know, when <laughs> when Ken's like, all right, Frank's going to train you in grappling now. I was like, all right, well, I got all this knowledge. And so he was thirsty for the knowledge. And I was terrified of striking because I had no I had no knowledge. And the knowledge Ken gave me was, you know, was was handed down a few generations and not studied well. So Maurice was an expert at striking and had, mm -hmm. you know, friendships and like he was amazing. And then he also had much more knowledge. He had vascular training knowledge and conditioning knowledge that yeah. I did not know. That was totally new to me. So here's the funny thing, because Ken didn't want to fulfill his responsibilities. I got a lifelong brother, friend, trainer, <laughs> coach. <laughs> it all worked out. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. So when you see the alliance, that's what that was. And then when I left, he Ken Maurice was like, bro, you're my teacher, not Ken. <laughs> he handed me off. And so you're my brother. You're my teacher. I'm going with you. And Maurice was with me until the day I retired, you wow. know, good, a good man. I got to pay him back, you know, when, when he got into mixed martial arts, when he started fighting, you know, we fought Mark Coleman. Like I was his trainer. Like he, we, we can, I, can I interject, Frank? And uh, yeah. I know we're, we're, we're not supposed to be cutting you off and, and I, I sincerely apologize, but this is about nobody messed up Frank Shamrock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. So with, with Maurice, you guys formed this alliance. Yeah. Okay. My conspiracy is that John Peretti, here, Mark Coleman beats Dan Severn at UFC 12. They throw Tank Abbott, Ken Shamrock, Dan Fry. They bring a 500 fighter from rings named Maurice Smith over. And I think it's because they realized that you could master plan in order to get that belt taken off Coleman's waist. Nope. Nothing like that. Here's the truth. Maurice called me because he's my brother and I love him. And he said, hey, what do you think I'll be fighting for the uh, uh, UFC heavyweight title? And I go, oh, who has the title? Or I knew at the time. I go, uh, you mean Mark Coleman? He goes, yeah. I go, terrible idea. His reply, I already signed the contract. <laughs> my reply, you got this, brother. <laughs> we better start <laughs> training. <laughs> I love it. Positive. So, Thank you. Perfect. Coleman, well Coleman in our interview said, we, we have two interviews with Coleman, the first interview. He says, Shamrock told me that he was training Maury Smith and that I should be careful about him. I didn't pay it any attention. Yeah. All true. He laughed. Oh, Frankie. Oh, Frankie. He patted me on the head like I was a little boy. He said, oh, Frankie. <laughs> Frank, be before, uh, before we go too far, what? One of the things about you and Maurice Smith is that, aside from talent and athleticism and stuff, you guys are kindred spirits, you know? He's a goofball, too. Yeah, I mean, and, and I don't mean it like that, but it's like you guys had a way of managing the room where you could keep everybody off, off guard and stuff like that, and you guys were clearly the A guys, obviously. Yeah. Do you remember... Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a story in a minute. Go ahead, though. Talk about that dichotomy. Well, it's just, you know, I I came from a world where you couldn't ask questions and you couldn't question the master. And 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 it came down to beatings and it was it was it was counterproductive for what I needed to do and learn. And but when Maurice taught me, he would give you a logical explanation with a biomechanical answer and then show you the technique and then show you variations of it like a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Oh my God, this is amazing. I was like, I didn't know these people existed. So I had the same 
process. You know, I was ma- I was mainly focused on learning the truth and then giving that to other people, like using the skills that I was learning. And so we just, you know, I didn't know the striking. He did. I He, he didn't know the grappling. I did. And, you know, we, we formed such a wonderful bond, you know, learning, teaching, you know, sharing with each other. And then, you know, Maurice grew up like I did. You know, he didn't have a dad. He, you know, he didn't have he didn't have stuff and he fought for it. And that's how we, you know, we ended up becoming brothers. I mean, he is my brother. If he calls me, you know, tomorrow I'll be there no matter where it is because he's always been there for me. And that's, you know, when you're a warrior and you trust no one and someone shows you that type of love and respect and care, that's your brother. I'll tell you a story. I don't know if it'll come across, but a UFC rule meeting and John McCarthy's, you know, being all serious and says, you know, going through the rules, you can't eye poke, you can't, you know, manipulate groin. And Maurice Smith raises his hand and says, can you manipulate your own groin? (laughs) (laughs) I am certain that is the truth. Uh, And what, is is Maurice does what I do. We use humor because we've had such pain. We use humor and intellect to, you know, lighten people's load. But behind that, like with Maurice, is a very sharp, you know, tactical mind. And and we shared that together. You know, whether it's whatever wherever it came from, you know, we shared that that tactical mind. When he fought Mark Coleman, I wrote Uh, five moves on a piece of paper and said, Maurice Smith, if you do these five moves every day, you're going to beat Mark Coleman. And every day he complained, I'm never going to do, he's never going to get me down. Uh," And he would bellyache endlessly while doing these five moves. And if you watch the fight again, you'll see he basically does five moves. (laughs) And then he beats the hell out of him. (laughs) The thing about Coleman and then of yourself, and we, we, your question mark about this in our first interview with him here, you, you get him with uh, Maurice Smith, which there was a little questionable refereeing on Big John McCarthy's part on that. Then you trained Don Fry for the rematch. Then you trained Pete Williams. And well, I mean, Don Fry was after Pete Williams, obviously. And from what I understand, you would call some of his opponents. Right? How do you guys keep crossing paths? I mean, is the spike world just so small at this point? Yeah, at the time it was really small, and everybody, okay. everybody, and so it wasn't, you know. And then you got to remember, you know, like we weren't allowed to train with anybody named Gracie, any affiliate, any <laughs> school, no nothing. And so, you know, it was very confusing to me because we're all supposed to be martial artists. But I would literally show up at some guy's place. I'd be wrestling. And then all of a sudden, they'd be like, da, 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 da. and they'd be like, I'm sorry, Mr. Shamrock, you have to leave. And I'm like, what? <laughs> because they they would really? be Gracie people. And in that culture, like the culture I grew up in with the lion's den, you didn't, you weren't allowed. And so it was no this way. Yeah. And that's why eventually got their ass kicked because they refused to evolve and think and allow and participate and grow. And and it was against what I learned in martial arts, which was we're all in search of the, we all have value to each other. We work our mind, body, and spirit and that path and, you know, get out. Um, But I found the Machados and they were wonderful. And they went, what? That's crazy. We're martial artists. Like we'll train with you. And they were the only ones that would. And they were, you know, some of the best guys in the world, and they were wonderful, and still my friend to this day, because they went, yeah, that's that's stupid. Like we all need, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's what I thought, but I just want to double check. And so, yeah, but you know, it's hard to imagine now, right? Because we're at version, you know, five point but this was version one. You know, nobody knew anything. Everyone was terrified, and they were all pretending to be tough guys and holding on to the. <laughs> Frank, going, did you did that. you actually we're put <laughs> did you actually put the gi on with the machados? Yeah, I did gi and then no gi. Um, I never had any use for the gi because I never fought in a gi, or so I put it on out of respect, and I they would show me things, but I would always say, "Great, how does it work without a gi?" 
And can, can you explain to me the biomechanics of how the body's working here? And then that would quickly get to the truth or the simplest, you know, variation of the technique. There was a rumor. Yeah, for sure. I agree. There was a rumor that you and Hickson were supposed to be, at least there was talks about a fight between you two coming together. Yeah, I think it was talk for a while. But, um, you know, with one statement, which he always said uh, after the UFC, uh, oh, if you think I'm good, you should see my older brother. Uh, he was able to position himself in Japan, you know, which really, you know, values that, you know, warrior mindset culture. He was able to position himself of such a value that I it took me so long to get to his league that he and then I was so good by then. Uh, the, the probability of it ever happening was was zero. You know, he would ask too much and then the risk would be too high. So, you know, I thought about it and I hoped for it, but, you know, whatever. Uh, you had a rough patch. It started uh, before you became a champion. And not all that make glitters is gold. You go out, you fight Yuki Kondo September 7th, 1996, the Pancreas Anniversary Show. And it was, it was hard to watch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's when I... You know, for the first time in my life, I, I wasn't focused. You know, I wasn't trained hard. I was being lazy. And, you know, I remember Kondo. He was a young boy with me. You know, he was a punching bag. Like, we just beat him up. You know, he was wow. like me. <laughs> so we would beat the heck out of him. Um, so when they told me I was fighting Kondo, I was like, oh, great. I got the money. Uh, and I, at the time I got a, a new Japanese girlfriend and I, who knows what I was doing, but it wasn't focusing or training. And yeah, he showed up an entirely different human being, both spirit and strength. I think he gained like 20 pounds of muscle and yeah, he thoroughly kicked my ass. You, you know, it's amazing real quick, Mike, it's amazing in this sport. I mean, the same thing happens all the time. You just saw it this past weekend, you know, Usman, he was talking about everybody besides his opponent. You know, he's talking about I'm going to go up to 205 and I'm going to fight for the title there and I'm going to I'm going to box Jake. You know, Paul. He never brought up Leon Edwards' name until the fight. He lost. I mean, he still dominated the fight, but he lost that focus for one second. I felt going into that fight I was like he's not talking about this guy. You got to be careful. You can't do that. This, but it's been happening for. 20, 30 years, it, it's going to be the same no matter, never going to quit. You know, it's never going to change. You got to be focused and nobody ever is all the time. Yeah, you know, the enemy is the ego. Yeah. It's Seriously. the ego is the worst thing in the world and it's total garbage and it's <laughs> great every single time. And the hardest thing in the world is when you walk into a room and everybody loves you, tells you how wonderful you are, yep. gives you everything and anything. And then you're like, oh, wait, wait, I got to cut this short and go do some vascular training. Yeah. It's, it's the same, right? <laughs> well, well, with Yuki, you actually I took, took a body kick, fell out of the ring, and it was a pretty scary fall, the way you hit your head oh, yeah. on, on the floor. Yeah, it's the only, first time I've ever been knocked out. Um, and then, um, yeah, it was so bad, I actually shifted the bone plates in my head, which I didn't know was possible. Uh, it happens to babies and, and elderly people. But, yeah, uh, they didn't used to have pads around the ring. They, they got them after that fight, much like they filled the retirement clause after my exit. And, <laughs> uh, you know, they, it, it uh, yeah, so I, I, when I grabbed the doorknob in my eyes, it was right in front of me. When my hand reached out, my hand was like three inches to the left of the doorknob. Oh. And, and that was my visual perception. I was like, whoa, there's something really wrong here. And it was to and uh, luckily, uh, I was flying to a UFC fight uh, straight from Japan. So I went to L.A. and then I think I bounced out to God, who knows where we were at that time, Wyoming or something. Um, Alabama, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Alabama, who knows? But I went uh, and then Gold's Gym was our sponsor. So I went to the Gold's Gym meet and greet way in extravaganza thing and i met this crazy uh, chiropractor named hank de i'll never forget him because i was in terrible pain and i was like man this is really bad and there's something wrong with me I've never been hurt before uh and hank uh goes oh yeah yeah it's a really uncommon thing it happens to babies and old people and he's like uh puts on a glove and he goes this is gonna hurt 
and I need to reach into your mouth. And I go, what? And he literally reached in and he's digging into these muscles in my uh, jaw and mouth, my upper like uh, cranial area. And then as he's digging, I can feel the bones move back in place. And they were like, Bleh. yeah, crazy. Hey, you're, you're more trusting than I am. That could have been so <laughs> you know, like, he could have been oh, so weird. Uh, no, but I, when I, I told him my problem and I, and I, I, you know, I was like, yeah, man. And, and he's like, wow, you're really built. And I'm like, yeah, man, but I had something wrong with this. Something really, really, and nothing had ever been wrong with me at that time, you know? Um, and when I explain it to him, you could see his eyes light up because I don't think he'd ever experienced it before. Like, I don't think he'd ever, you know, he read about in textbooks. So all of a sudden this big burly knucklehead with bone plates shifted shows up and he has a chance to apply his knowledge. So for both of us, it was like super beneficial. And uh, yeah. Was I, in the bar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you lose, you, you lose to Kondo. Then you go December, you fight Kiyuma Kinioku. Kuni. Take your second, Kuni. Take your second loss. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty humbling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a weird time because Ken had left. And, you know, the problem with, with um you know keeping your team under you is if you don't teach them to grow you know when you go away the you know the mice will play and so without the fear of being beaten and and having that oversight you know i just i didn't train hard you know i was a knucklehead and left to my own devices i normally am a knucklehead and so that was my you know knucklehead area era um and then also i noticed like once ken left that kind of you know the japanese treated us very well and they were very respectful and they always you know they always are it's a great culture but um you know it had a different feeling it had a different energy about it and it wasn't welcoming and friendly they were still the same but there just was something different you know and maybe it was because my master had left and who knows but i didn't perform well i wasn't focused i wasn't you know training the hardest and and i led my team astray and I, and I let them down you know, that was part of, you know, the reason why I left and why Ken was so mad at me. And I wasn't being a good leader in his absence, you know, because I really didn't know how. And then you wind up in Super Brawl against John Lober. So it's, you go from a completely different rule set and you're in Y. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was my big wake-up call. You know, I, I didn't realize how... You know, this stuff from my childhood was affecting me. Like, who becomes a professional fighter and then doesn't want to hurt people? <laughs> like, like, it didn't make any sense. So I would let people beat on me until they got tired, because that's also what I was taught. And, you know, it wasn't until I fought John Lober, you know, I could have broken his arm. I could have broken his leg. I could have broken his shoulder. Back but to I'd be so. like, bro. And he just didn't care. And I hadn't experienced that yet. And I also wasn't ready to break someone's arm or break someone's leg. You know, I broke Alan Goez's leg because I was scared he was going to get up and keep hitting me. Because <laughs> he was an animal. But I hadn't done that, you know, purpose, purposefully. Um, and, wow. you know, I took the loss. I, you know, and it cost me $10,000, which at that time was a lot of money. Um, and then it, you know, it, it, greatly impacted my career because I a string of losses uh but that was the moment where I realized man there's something wrong with me you know that I can't do my job and you know it took a long hike and you know reconnecting with God to sort of understand that you know if I pick up a sword and I swing it you know it is what it is you know if you don't want to pick up the sword then that's a different conversation but I already I already had a sword in my hand and I wasn't swinging it and so once I made that decision, you can see my record. I didn't lose for 10 years. Did, did, oh, did, did, you, have a, did you have a philosophical uh, moment where you compared the difference between Pancrase and MMA? You know, it wasn't even philosophical. I never do MMA, but I never wanted to fight. You know, I, I, it, it was a lot. You know, this is, this is because I was too stupid to, you know, keep my life together. Um, and, you know, while I always dreamt of being a champion, like I think every boy does, you know, I was terrified of fighting because you can't be abused 
child and then not feel uncomfortable with hurting other people. You know, it hurts your when you do that. And so for me, it was a journey. And, you know, it was a personal journey. No one else knew what was going on. They were all <laughs> celebrating and happy and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. But, you know, I, I struggled because I just didn't want to hurt people because I knew the pain that, it, you know, when you, when you hurt somebody. And so, yeah, I, I was in Hawaii and I literally climbed to the top of Diamond Head and I just sat there for hours and I, you know, I reconnected with God and I, you know, I asked him like, you know, what's wrong with me? Like, you know, what am I doing and why can't I do this? And, uh, you know, he told me, if you pick up a sword, you swing it. If you don't want to pick up the sword then do something else because <laughs> that's how things work. And, you know, the battle was within me. It was my own thing. It had nothing to do with the sport or anybody else. Um, but from that moment forward, I kill everyone because <laughs> that was my, you know, change in, in psyche that, that was needed. Were you medicating at that time too? Oh yeah. 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 I never stopped, you know, uh, I'd smoke cannabis until the well, post retirement, but every day, you know, as part of my, <laughs> as part of my medicine, um, you know, it did two things for me. It helped me sleep. And it really helped me deal with the anxiety. You know, I was a terribly anxious person anyways, but, you know, knowing you're going to go to work tomorrow, get your ass kicked. And then in a few months, some other guy from a foreign country is going to try to kick your ass too. <laughs> that for me was really stressful. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that every time I asked somebody, I could tell they didn't know the answer. That was really stressful because someone could have just said, hey, man, we don't know, but we're all looking. And that would have made it just feel better. But, you know, it was too much, you know, mastery and mochismo and tough guyness. And I was the only guy going, I'm scared. And can I ask a question, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think the misconception is, you know, we started this interview saying that you were, you were abused in, in some of the foster homes. The mentality of somebody that's been sexually abused is they see themselves as, rock solid, super athlete, but they don't see themselves as that innocent child that was taken advantage of. And they see themselves as how they are today. And it's torturous. It's like the person just keeps spinning around in their head. And one of the ways out is medicating through alcohol and drugs. Yeah. And sure. it's, it's not an easy thing to let go of. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, that's why I do all these, self-defense programs for battered women i write all these programs because you know it's really hard on a human being to experience things like that and then to feel good you can feel better you can feel better about it but to generally feel good is a challenge you know because someone is you know hurt you so deeply you know especially when you're vulnerable or you're a child um and it's just, re it takes a lot of work to move through that. And most people don't. Most people, it changes them for the rest of their lives. And I, I, when I write these, I tell these girls, fight your ass off because it will change your life if you don't. And it'll change your life in a way you will not want. And it will stay with you for a long, long time. And then these girls get down. They're like, all right, we got you. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the... My belief is one of the most overlooked things in your career that speaks volumes of just your athletic ability is you competed in the Contenders, which is a pure wrestling league with submissions, October 11th, 1997, and they give you Dan Henderson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But hold on. Dan Henderson with shoes on, which is like <laughs> walking into a gunfight and handing somebody your gun. Here, here. Uh, let me give you that one. Uh, so, yeah, while I was nervous about his wrestling, the moment I saw him wearing shoes, I was like, yeah, I got this one. And how how, how do you feel about that one in an MMA fight? Yeah. Say again? How, how would you feel about fighting Dan in an MMA fight back then? Uh, I would have fought him back then, not when he learned how to strike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our move. No, yeah, Dan... Uh, yeah. Right that contenders also. fight was was definitely one of those that was a feather in your cap because you did that and then actually didn't you you wiped out Kevin Jackson in the UFC too didn't you? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Armbarred him. But I can say uh, Kevin Jackson, his arm felt like a 90-year-old woman. Like, I got it, and it felt like butter, and it started popping right away. Dan Henderson, when I tied up with him, it felt like I was grabbing an oak tree. And you watch it, if you watch the match, I grab him, and I'm like, what the hell? And he does, like, this half-inch shrug shuck thing, and I fall to the ground because he was <laughs> I was like, what on earth is happening with this man? He was so strong. He was so powerful in his positions. And um, I made up that he, uh, he was so strong that I thought I need to swing on his strength. I need to use his own strength against him because I can never battle it. And so I actually swung underneath him because I felt how strong he was. Wow. And I, yeah, I literally swung like an ape on his frame because he was so strong. Hmm. Was, was, oh, did you ever hear the rumor that Kat, your brother Ken was poisoned against Fujita? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I, I <laughs> listen to that stuff, partly because I, I lived with Jason for so long and he was the crazy conspiratorial, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. training the Gracies and like, you know, it was just all this amazing stuff that if your mind is not focused when you are dealing with important things, it wanders off and it goes in those directions. But mine was about mechanics, you know, diagnosing the data, applying it, and then what was the result. So I didn't waste any time with any of that stuff. It didn't, it, if you couldn't prove it and show me the proof and then do it on me and then explain it in detail, I just, I was like, mm -hmm, sounds good to me. And I would just move on to the next thing. Because to me, that's, that's what warfare is about. You you have real data or you die. And I was in it all, all in. Like I was willing to die. I still carry the million dollar life insurance policy that I took out 20 years ago because I was certain that someday somebody's going to meet, I'm going to meet somebody just like me who is unwilling to stop, unrelenting, and they're going to have to kill me to get me out of here because that was my intention. And I brought that to everybody. And most people aren't ready for that in business, mm -hmm. in life, fighting, in anything. Most people aren't ready for that. I had to pick one fight that describes Frank Shamrock and just your will to die in a fight. I think that's Ensign anyway. I think that's, that's the fight that I would pin that on. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and that's the only time where anybody's brought me close to that point where I went, whoa, whoa, maybe this is the moment. And, <laughs> and nobody else has ever brought me there, but he did. And it was, it was really powerful for both of us because, you know, I, I talked about it and I committed to it, but I'd never gone there. And this is the real test of a man and their intentions. You know, <laughs> everyone says they're, you know, walks the walk, but, you know, when it comes time to do it and really do it, what kind of courage do you have? And, you know, when I started thinking about this is it, you know, I'm going to die and this, this really sucks. Um, you know, I started telling myself, oh, okay, you know, this is it. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, hell no. And that, that decision, you know, changed my psyche, you know, a thousand percent. Because I realized everybody has that in them. You know, we accept defeat long before we are beaten, before we are dead. And there was no, that man was never going to kill me that night unless I said, okay. And you see the result. I went, wait a minute, what am I thinking? What's going on here? And I went, oh, hell no. And I, I leaped forward, you know, 10,000 steps because it, I made the intention and then I acted on it. And many of us just go, yeah, yeah, I got a great idea. Oh, here's my intention. Oh, yeah, yeah. But we never get pressed. We never get asked to test it. We never go to the end. And I've taken many men to the end. And most mm -hmm. men don't even want to look at it. Now, to set the NUA fight up, it's a very close first round, but you're pulling ahead. And it's as plain as day that you're about to kind of ride past the finish line in the second round. And NUA runs his engine on red. And he's able to do it for such a, a long period of time to where he almost finishes you a couple times. And then, you know, you just, you, you put your foot on his throat, you stop the fight. 
Egan runs in, Maury Smith, there's kind of a, a mini riot towards the yeah. NFL. Yeah, that was our first good uh, riot going on there. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I don't know who was judging what or whatever, but um, I was I was locked in battle. And, you know, uh, I was I was down. You know, one of us was going down. I could feel his intention. He, you know, he 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 committed too, uh, but no one had ever pushed him to the end, and so we both were going to do that thing until one of us fell. And you know, we're we're close friends now. Like it changed both of our lives. If for him as a warrior, for me as a human being, it also was my qualifier to get into the UFC. Whoever won that one was going to be in the UFC, and. You know, that was my goal, my dream. Uh, and he was just happened to be in my way that night. Um, if you look at the fight, you can see when he folds me over backwards, bounce me. Um, it really hurt my back. You know, I, I, I broke one of my vertebrae when I was 16. And so they told me I'd never play sports. I'd never played contact sports. I was going to be in pain for the rest of my life. Oh. And I managed spinal stability and drug addiction for my entire life because of a lifetime of pain that I was about to be living. Or I could do spinal surgery and spend a year in a body cast. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no, that's going to happen. So I just kept carrying on. But when he folded me over backwards, it really it like messed up my spine. And so that was in the back of my head. I was in pain. He was mounting me. And, you know, I thought it was the end. But he, said, uh, he was real emotional talking about that fight. Like it, yeah. you can tell it hurts him, but he's glad he tried to die fighting. Yeah, no, it, like was, it meant yeah. just as much to him as it did you. Totally. And when I see him, he hugs me like I'm his long lost brother, and we reminisce and we have the most loving moment for about ten minutes, and then he circles back with, "You know, if I would have beat you that night," and he goes down. There. <laughs> And I just hug him and I say, brother, it is what it is. Like, we, you know, we're, it bothers him. You know yeah. that, that's, that is the cool thing about the fighting, though, man, is uh, it, it's not just about, you know, to me, it, it wasn't just about wins and losses. It's that, uh, that emotional, spiritual thing, like it's testing you against yourself. And I'd rather lose certain fights, but just know that I did what, you know what I mean? I don't think a lot of people can understand that, especially nowadays, it's a different animal, but Man, that meant a lot to me. And there, there's some of my favorite fights or even losses. You know what I mean? Just because you, you prove a lot to yourself. And I understand that totally. I know a lot of people couldn't understand that. It's a weird thing, but it, you go back, it goes back to middle school. I met all my friends because we had beef. We went in the back. We got in a fight. And then we hugged it out. And then we're <laughs> like, oh, there's something about this guy I like. Because now that we've done this thing. Yeah. Yeah, and as a grown man, where do you get to experience that? But in mixed martial arts, and yeah. bro, we I'm fighting fools to the death, and when I'm done, they are my <laughs> brother. Like I'm like, man, you're all right. <laughs> I'm like a grade school kid. Yeah. What was it like training Rulon Gardner? Um, I never trained him. He mentioned that the beginning of his pride fight that he was with you for a few weeks. No. No, I think it was Ken. It's probably with Ken. They mentioned your name. Okay. Uh, Let, well, let's talk about... Let me catch you there. You will, can't imagine how many thousands of people I've met who have told me they train with Frank Shamrock, and I've never seen these people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> really? I had a kid oh. come up at the airport because I had a UFC hat on. And he proceeded to tell me, and I, it's a compliment to me. He proceeded to tell me how wonderful it was training with me, how how much I taught, you know, how much, because he didn't know it was me. Yeah. And so he's a shirt. He goes, oh, my God, I trained with Frank Shamrock. And he goes on, and he's like, man, he's such a good man. And he taught me so many things. And and, and uh, it, to me, it was like, it's, just, it's a powerful experience because, you know, it means so much to this young man that he's oblivious to reality. He's living in this other space, but it's helping him. And he's good. And so all that's part. And here's what I said. I go, man, that sounds amazing. He sounds like a great man. And then I walk away. <laughs> like, my, 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 not, not Lizzie. 
not only is he a great guy, he's handsome, you know, like, yeah. 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 talented, well, well spoken, I bet, you know. It's cool. <laughs> Mike, you didn't know about our time, handles, you know. Chris. Yeah, I got a purple belt under Chris Lytle, so <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I like your style, Chris. I'm gonna start adding more. I'm like, yeah, here's that handsome, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I wasn't taken, you know, <laughs> so let's there, there seems to be people curious in regards to like your the gyms. First, you started at the Lion's Den, yeah. Then you go to the Alliance. Yep. Yeah. You form the Alliance, I should say. Yeah. You appear over at AKA, then Team Shamrock, and then yeah. is it Universal Submission Academy? Yeah. Did I miss any in between? No. Yeah, no. For me, it was more about uh, teams and groups. So, you know, because I, I didn't have family and I, I kind of grew up alone. I was always trying to build my team, you know, my, my boys, my group, my, my thing. And then once I got into fighting, it was organic. Like we had a team. Uh, but when I, you know, when I left the lion's den, they're like, you're with us or against us. No one can talk to you. I had to build my own group. And so I did what I do with my own family. Now I just brought in the people I love and I care about and that have value to me in my life. And that's how I build my family. You know, you, if you're a good person and you do good things and you bring value to, to us, our group, our team or whatever, that's that to me is what the value is. I never was worried about the team name or who takes credit or like any of that shit. <laughs> I never cared about because it wasn't of value to me. What was the, the knowledge was value. And then, you know, I also had this weird thing happen to me. You know, I would I would be the only one asking questions all the time. And then all of a sudden, people started asking me questions. And I could see there was a culture shift happening. People were feeling okay to ask questions. And so I would answer, and then I would teach, and I would do whatever I could. And, you know, selfishly, that process was teaching me how, teaching me more about the martial art. I was learning better by teaching. I was learning more by refining it through teaching. And so we were all helping each other in this circle. And that's what it's about. I never cared about the team and the name and all this. We could have been team, who gives a shit? Because to me, it was about the, we were brothers. Like we're, we're in this together, we're going to war. Who do I want to stand next to when I'm ready to give my life up for something I believe in? Who do I want to stand next to? Some asshole? No. Somebody I trust, who I love, who's willing to bleed with me. Somebody like Maurice Smith. And, you know, like, I'd be like, name the team. I don't care. <laughs> Let's follow the mission because <laughs> it's always more important. We got to survive this thing and be okay at the end of it. Because if we're not, that's a crappy journey. Like, that's crap, you know? For sure. Did, did you ever almost fight Sakuraba? Did those talks I ever did. come together? Yeah, yeah. Well, I negotiated hard for years. It's, it's wow. uh, the Sakuraba fight in his prime and Ken fight before I got too old, were the only two matches I couldn't put together. I was a pretty good businessman. Um, but I couldn't I couldn't land those two. It was too many politics and mechanics with Sakuraba. And then Ken was just a little goofy on the the value. He always had to be above me. So <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't figure the business out. Yeah, it was complicated. <laughs> Chris, this is a phenomenal interview. Man, you're not kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, I missed the first few minutes of it or 45 or now, whatever. But, you know, um, I caught the good stuff at least. I saw the good stuff. I'll see the good stuff when I watch the rest of it back. Uh, uh, Frank, just, um, man, amazing career. I, like I said, I remember when I watched that first, I hadn't been involved with the sport too much. But when you, you know, I knew, watched a bunch of your fights when you fought Tito, I, that, that changed the way I looked at sports. Like, dude. This is unreal. This guy's an unbelievable fighter. I'm just uh, so you changed the way I looked at things for a long time, right there. I just thought you got this big monster on you can't win. No, you can win, and you did. So, um, but just not only that, just your whole career doing crazy stuff. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you guys having me. It's good to talk about the old days and and the lessons we learned. Yeah, man, for, for sure, Frank. Frank, let me tell you, man. You know. Obviously, a historic career, there may be dozens of lessons that people can learn from you. But the one 
that I carry with me that I tell people, you got to watch this sequence of stuff. And that is your uh, fight with John Lober. Oh, good one. And then the rematch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I was actually at that rematch in Brazil. Yeah. And that was, you know, you'd learned about brutality by then. You were a little, you, you were looking a little like Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had an added uh, advantage because uh, John was picking on me. Yeah, he was, he, he, he's, you know, he's an yeah. interesting character. Yeah, he was, character. he was picking on me. He was, he was calling room service, like doing all kinds of things to make me mad. And it actually worked. I got mad. <laughs> I could have finished him in about three minutes. And then I prolonged it because I just wanted to beat the hell. Get back on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but dumb. One of the dumbest mistakes I've ever made, and the all, and the, the first and only time I let my emotions dictate my actions. Um, and then, are you ready for this? At the airport, he looks at me. His face is all hacked open, chopped up. He's all broken, and he comes over and he goes, "Hey, man, I'm sorry for saying all those things. <laughs> it's the only way to get myself up for this fight." And I was like, "Oh, he totally got me." <laughs> <laughs> Cool, yeah. cool, cool. Man, interesting that's, guy. That's a closer if I ever heard one. Frank, thank you so much. You're a legend and always will be, brother. Absolute legend. Uh, I appreciate you. it, guys. Thank you. Be well, man. Peace. Hey, Lights Out Podcast and Mike, a big one. We got Frank Shamrock in the books. That's a good one. Yeah, you know, a lot of people to thank, but we I want to start with Fred, Fred Hammer, our buddy. He, he's a longtime fan of the podcast. He's been with us, I don't know, since the very, very beginning, but he's an early bird. He's been around. He's listened to a lot of the old ones and stuff. And um, at some point in his life, he, he sold a bike to Frank Shamrock. <laughs> and that's how this interview came about. And, uh, well, you know, that's a go. fan. That's a guy that's a guy who's aboard. And, and Fred, we can't thank you enough, man. So Craigslist facilitated this meeting between us. Under most contexts, that would be uh, that would mean like you, you your name would be in the newspaper. But in this instance, we got Frank Shamrock. So dude, Fred Hammer, old school punk guy, um, gives us lots of information about the Southern California scene. A lot of times, people ask us, you know, how did you guys know these little tiny details about you know Southern California MMA? You know, truth be told, it's Fred Hammer. He uh, snuck us Frank Shamrock's phone number, thought about it, texted Frank. Frank agreed. Um, <clears throat> got a hold of us the same day. It all worked out. Y you know, Miguel, here's the thing. <clears throat> we don't have a staff. It's you, I, and Chris with you and I doing the majority of the lifting here. And, you know, Chris has got bare knuckle. He's got the name. And he's absolutely phenomenal when he joins us. It's our best podcasts are when, when he's involved. Chris Chris is, is the perfect face, and, and he needs Absolutely. our support, but it is a three-man team, and that's it. That's all we got. <laughs> so we're trying. So when people like Fred go out of their way to do some lifting for us, it helps so much. Like I think we've got like a dozen interviews still that I got to get times for. I just I haven't been able to do it because work, family, you know, studying for this podcast it's just it's, yeah, i only get so much time in a day but when people do go out of the way for us it really helps us out on mixedmartialarts.com it's absolutely the most jaded mma forum in the entire world with the angriest human beings that you just grow to love because of just how sour they are and just how they're not going to be fooled by whatever BS the media is trying to feed them. So on the underground forum on MMA.tv, MixedMartialArts.com, MMA, pure, MMA Purist, Wes Sims gave me your name. He, in fact, Wes Sims gave me all of these names. These are the people that you know we have to thank. MMA Purist, you and Crowbar doing uh, threads over there you know, about our podcast. Greatly appreciated. Petey Wheatstraw, Rambo John Jay who Sim sent me a breakdown of why our podcast will never be accepted by the UFC. Dude's a brilliant guy. Knockout fighter, vamp, to breathe, to feel. All of those people allow us to grow and put exposure on us. And we appreciate it. 
and, and the list, you know, goes on. You, you, you know, old schoolers, Genghis Conrad. I think Mike Crane is Crowbar, right? Yes. And so, you know, Mike Mike uses all his sign <laughs> He uses his Crowbar sign He uses Mike Crane sign He's doing comments. Guys, guys like that, they, they're in the Fred Hammer list, too. Like they, They've been with us for almost, you know, over 100 podcasts already. So, well, um, well here, great. now we're yeah. talking YouTube. DeVry's Town, dude, thank you. Um, Lee the Flea, you like talking crazy? Dude, we appreciate it. Thank you. Josh Gage, 802 Reptiles, those guys really help us out. If somebody's posting on Reddit, please let us know. I, I've attempted to post our stuff on Reddit, and it immediately gets shut down because I'm associated with the podcast. So if somebody can handle Reddit for us, send us what you're doing. We'll thank you as well. But let's talk Frank Shamrock. Dude, is that a breakthrough interview or what? You know, I know Frank from from back in those <clears throat> when he was champion, and I rem- I was worried in the interview because – I, I thought Frank, you know, might not take it serious. Like, he's got like that, like, yeah, you know, eh, I don't like to do interviews. Maybe I'll give one yeah. word answers. That, you know, you could get that version of Frank in the old days. And I was a little worried because that's not what our podcast is for. You know what I mean? Our podcast is kind of like, you know, the, the confession yes. booth. And, 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 and yeah. but it was completely not that. Frank, Frank came with, you know, he was prepared for the interview, but I think he, he 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 touched on a lot of stuff that we that he wasn't prepared. Like I think we caught him off guard a couple of times. I think we got and we got a really good genuine version of him where he can be very tailored too when he's in that atmosphere. So I'm well, really happy with the interview. Well, I, I one never, of those things. I didn't think we could pull it off that way. No, no, I was good. You know, and, and I thought we hit him a little quick, too, with the Bob Shamrock stuff. But here's the thing about heroes of life. Some people like Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. When you get to be an adult, your heroes are people that have sacrificed their own time and life for others that they never even thought they would get a return on financially. And the only... Two of the people in the mixed martial arts world that can absolutely be associated with that is Carlson Gracie Sr. and Bob Shamrock. Now, are there other people? Of course there are. But the old school heads from the beginning, they took on children that weren't theirs, fed them, cared for them, loved them. And they were all the same types of kids, kids that could ruin somebody else's day at a split second or be in prison for the rest of their life being the toughest guy in the prison, but instead they're on our TV screens. They're fighting for us. And yeah. Bob Shamrock and Carlson Gracie Sr. help facilitate that. Yeah, I think Bob is a guy that, um, you know, Frank referred to him. He said he was flashy wearing gold and stuff like that. And he was an older guy at the time too. So so some people may, may have judged him like on the surface and stuff like a certain way. And I wanted to get that clear with, with what Frank would wanted to say right away. And I think that when he rose to his defense, you know, when we interviewed Delusia, Delusia said the same thing. He said that Bob Shamrock was a good Christian man, um, that, that sort of stuff. And, you know, I'll be honest, you know, we've talked offline about certain things and stuff. And sometimes, you know, we've had conversations about the whole Fox catcher thing and Bob, Bob's system and were there similarities and stuff. And I'm glad that, 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 that he nipped that in the bud and killed that in my head too, for me, because Shamrock is not that. And, you know, the other guy is something like that. And, and, and let that be clear to everybody because people talk bad in, in certain cases, you know, both Ken and Frank are poster boy guys, good looking guys, an older man taking care of them and stuff like that. It's very easy for people to be low and I think, you know, Frank, Frank handled that for us in the podcast. I think the kicker on it was he said, you know, he, he treated me with nothing but respect, and I'm a guy who's been molested many times. You know, it's, really? it's real power and strength that, that he, he gave us, uh, you know, the, the seal of approval of Bob. And I think that that's important to document because if not, then people are going to read threads and, they, you know, they might hear, read a thread that has 
as the innuendos, like I said. For sure. And that question has never been asked direct where, you know, we addressed an interview where I think therein lied the issue was <clears throat> he, admit, he admitted to being sexually abused and Frank Shamrock's there or Bob Shamrock is, you know, s- somewhere else in the book and people connected the two, which shouldn't have, I think it was just poor reading comprehension on the people that are saying that, that had read the book. And, you know, statues are made of people. Uh, I, I, think, make, I, think, uh, I think you got to, in, in the context of the old days, Frank and Ken were two of the biggest stars in the sport. They've got a minder. And, and like, if you remember the Scott Bissack interview, he, he was pretty clear about it. He said, you know, when we rolled, we were lions then. So, like, for example, like, they, they got their travel covered for through Bob. But Bob, so Bob was like a manager relationship kind of thing where he dealt with the Japan thing, dealt with them, but he got them special privileges as the Lions then and and, and things like that. So it's easy when someone's taking care of people like that for them to, you know, take it to the next step and be like, oh, you know, he, he must like, you know, good looking young men, you know what I mean? Ripped up muscular young men. And whether he did or not, doesn't really matter what he felt inside. The bottom line is, is on... When you ask the guys, he was nothing but a caring person for them, and they all refer to him as somebody who's a father figure. Frank says he emulates him still. I think Jason Delucia said things like that. So think I about think that. To, to, to erase those, like I said, innuendos. I, maybe I'm too old, and, and maybe a lot of that's gone, and I'm the idiot bringing it up. But I, I remembered it from those days where it's like people wonder, it's like, you know, is Bob's like a little more than just – you know, caring for kids is it doesn't go beyond that. And I, I think it was important that Frank well, came out strongly telling us what 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 was the case. Well, it, it, an MMA coach once told me a person suffers two deaths. One time when they leave here, and a second time when people stop mentioning their name. At every instance in our interviews, or even when I'm doing you know, broadcasts on UFC Fight Pass. If I can mention Bob Shamrock or Carlson Gracie Sr., I do it at every instance because they deserve to be talked about. No, I I, I agree. We're, yeah, yeah, there you're talking about, you know, in the modern era of MMA, you're talking about a, a pair of pillars, a pair of pillars. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll forgive you that, you, you know, you also like to talk a little bit about, like, you know, the Richard Hamiltons and that sort of stuff as well. <laughs> oh, here, so there's like little footnotes that I really, I really enjoy that not a lot of people <clears throat> even know about. But once you hear about it, it's like it's unbelievable. You're like, there's no way that could be true. So when we get the Mark Kerr's on and we get the Mark Coleman's on, you know, Richard Hamilton is the first name out of my mouth. Absolutely. I want to know about that guy. There's a uh, an old boxing manager named Walk Miller, who they call him Walk the Squawk because he was just always a real loud mouthy guy that was never an A list manager, but would really work his hardest and get A level talent way before that they developed. And these people would be just like hostage by him. Um, Walk Miller uh, managed a uh, a German fighter. Um, Str- young Stribling, geez, I'm going for my memory. Young Stribling, and Young Stribling was getting just championed by El Capone. And, and Young Stribling goes, "Oh well, you know, I got a manager named Walk Miller. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't go with you." Well, one week later, Walk Miller was shot through the head and the heart, and it was ruled a suicide. So, like little footnotes like that of like Walk Miller, dude, you got to talk about that stuff. Like that's. I got a picture of Walk Miller on my wall. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a conversation piece. That's what I point to. And I say, oh, you know, you want to know about history? It, it, things like that uh, I get off on. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's important to, to history is, is about the truth, right? So I think it's important that the truth be told by, by the people who were there. And, and, you know, I think Frank did a job on that. From the start, he answered the hard question, and then he took it all the way through. We had more than two hours with him. Hopefully, we get him back to you know do the rest of his career. And um, 
you know, go from there. But yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful. I think it was a, a landmark interview and definitely one for the books. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.